Well, we'd like to welcome everybody this evening for our uh, FIN virtual conference, uh, Thursday, April 9th. Uh, hope everyone is uh, staying safe and healthy out there, practicing good social distancing and all the um, other ways of protecting yourselves during this crazy time. Uh, and with that, we're going to get started here today. We've got some really great content for all of you. Uh, we've got uh, several sessions today. Our opening session uh, is going to be about renewable energy and alternative fuels. We'll introduce that here in just a minute. And then we've got fundraising tips for teams. We've got some, uh, some folks with some great experience uh, in fundraising who uh, cross program. So I think we're really excited about having some folks to uh, be on tonight that if you're in FLL, FTC, FRC, it doesn't really matter. I think these uh, fundraising tips can help any of you. Uh, then uh, tonight, we have our big special guest speaker uh, with us this evening, Dave Lavery from NASA, uh, also a uh, mentor from Team 116. And, uh, and then at the end, we're going to wrap up with how to make a winning pick list uh, with Brian Maher. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, to start us off, though, as I said, we're going to be talking about uh, renewable energy and alternative fuels. I want to introduce Helen Rumsey. Uh, she's a senior at Columbus North High School. Uh, she's been on Team 4926 Galactech for four years. Uh, the past two years, she served as the programming team leader and oversaw the team's transition from LabVIEW, uh, LabVIEW to Java this year. Uh, she's going to attend Purdue University in the fall to study engineering. Congratulations to her on that. Uh, she founded the local Society of Women's Engineering Next Chapter in Columbus, Indiana. And uh, she also leads the Columbus North High School yearbook staff as its editor. So uh, without further ado, Helen, uh, welcome. And uh, you and Sam, uh, you can introduce him and, and take it away. Yes, thank you. So I'm here with Sam to talk about renewable energy and alternative fuels. So first, Sam, can you tell me about your background and how you became involved with alternative energy and renewable fuels? Sure, thanks, Helen. I'm really excited to be able to, to, to share some of my passion with regard to this topic. Um, I think the, the thing that really sparked my interest in, in renewable energy was uh, actually a college course. I took a uh, college course in solar energy engineering uh, as a, it was a graduate, pro, a graduate uh, class that I took during actually my undergraduate program at Purdue University. Um, I grew up in Indiana and um, I have two degrees in engineering from, from Purdue and uh, mechanical engineering degrees. And uh, during, the, during the course of my studies there, I was uh, able to be introduced to the, the basics of, of solar energy. And as um, you know, that really gave me a, a solid foundation in, in the basic concepts, um, but it sparked my interest because even at that time, it was obvious that uh, at some point in our future, uh, that would become uh, an extremely important topic, and it's never more important than today. So that's how I got into it. So what is renewable energy? Ah, what is renewable energy? That's a fantastic question because energy is everywhere. It's all around us. I mean, it's, uh, if, if Star Wars talks about the force, I mean, energy is what makes our lives possible today and every aspect of it. Renewable energy, basically, and it comes down to it fundamentally, there are more, more or less three types. You've got energy that comes, and, and I talk about renewable energy on the time scale of humans, right? Um, so solar energy is, is we consider renewable. Um, you know, on the, on the scale of the cosmos, uh, it's not necessarily renewable, uh, but on the scale of human time scales, it is. So solar energy is one. Uh, geothermal is another. Uh, so there are places on the earth where you can dig into the ground and access hot rocks. Um, volcanoes are another example, a little harder to, to harness than uh, hot rocks, but uh, uh, geothermal is, a, is another type form of renewable energy. And, and the third basically is uh, tidal energy. So as the, the moon and the, and the earth interact, uh, you, you've got the, the changing of the tides and uh, that's a form of renewable energy. And everything else that one would consider renewable is usually a, a, you know, a derivative of that. Like wind is also often considered renewable. And while that's true, it's ultimately sourced uh, you know, from, another, from another source, for example, the heat from the sun. 
So when we talk about renewable energies, they are forms of energy that are derived uh, on, the, on a, 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 a scale that can be recovered and, and, and reborn you know, within the human scale of life. So why should people care about renewable energy? Uh, well, you know, energy touches everything that we that we do, and you know, for the for most of human history, it's all all energy has been that we consume uh, has been you know fossil derived, and at this point in time, um, you know, the, our consumption of fossil fuels has uh, uh, it, it resulted in in the in climate change. You know, climate change is now uh, undeniably occurring, and it's. Uh, it's driven by human activity and the consumption of fossil fuels is primary to that. The impact of that is, you know, it's caused by humans, but it will affect humans and every other living thing on the planet. And so, you know, the, it's, a, it's a social problem. It's an economic problem. Um, there will be uh, impacts that will be felt by, by everyone uh, and are being felt today. And renewable energy is, is you know, a primary method or a method that will be utilized to help solve the problem. Um, the climate change won't be solved alone by by renewable energy, but that will be an important component of it. So it's fundamental to fundamental to the way we we live on this earth. Can you tell me a little bit about some projects that you've been involved with personally? Sure, um, and maybe it's helpful to to describe my background. Uh, I, I'm Sam Geckler. I I live here in Columbus, Indiana. I, my day job is, a, is an engineer with Cummins. Uh, I work uh, for a, a piston engine manufacturer uh, at, primarily at this point, although we have other products. And uh, throughout my career, um, I've had an opportunity to work on a number of engine programs that were uh, targeted toward the use of fuels that, that can be derived from uh, renewable energy. Actually, prior to becoming an engineer at Cummins, uh, I worked in the powertrain consulting industry and uh, had a pro the very first engine I ever ran as a, as a test engineer. And uh, let's just say shortly after first was born um, was a, uh, a single cylinder research engine that was fueled by methanol. And methanol is, a, is, a, is actually a very good fuel. It's a, it's a colorless, uh, virtually odorless um, liquid that burns very cleanly and has been considered a potential uh, fuel for uh, for internal combustion engines for many, many decades, actually. So in 1994, I was, the very first thing I did as a practicing engineer was, was test a methanol engine. But I've had opportunities over the years to, to work on uh, engines uh, that uh, use other fuels. For example, uh, ethanol, which is another alcohol. Methanol is an alcohol. Ethanol is an alcohol. And uh, in 2012, I was... Uh, fortunate to work on a program that was sponsored by the state of California to develop a, a, an engine that was purpose-built and designed for that fuel and was able to take advantage of all the properties of that fuel. And we, were, we uh, built and, and demonstrated that engine from the ground up and installed it in a, in a, in a walk-in van, like a UPS truck, delivery truck, uh, and demonstrate that in, in the state of California. So if you, if you Google Cummins ethos, you will find a very nice report that details how that uh, how that project turned out. Uh, more recently, uh, I've worked on a project to uh, demonstrate the capabilities of an engine running on propane. Um, propane is actually a fossil fuel as it's found in nature, but can be made in renewable ways. Uh, so these are all different types of, of internal combustion engines that can be used for transportation purposes. Uh, and running on either renewable fuels or fuels that can be made renewably. So how do um, renewable, or how does renewable energy vary from region to region and how does that make it hard? Yeah, so when we think about energy and the, the consumption of energy as a, as, a, as a human, as a person, uh, we, you know, we basically use in our transportation, gas and diesel primarily today although there are other fuels that are being used. And then at home, we tend to use electricity and natural gas, uh, either to heat or cool the home or operate the equipment in it. So depending on where you are, various types of renewable energy may be more or less available to you. Um, if I was living in the desert Southwest, um, where it 
sunny over 300 days a year, uh, photovoltaic panels might be a really nice uh, way to capture uh, renewable energy and utilize that. But if I'm living in a very cloudy place that um, doesn't have as much opportunity for uh, you know solar to be utilized, then I might, but it might be windy there. So maybe a, a, a wind installation may be more effective. Um, if I happen to live in an area where I can get, gain access to geothermal energy, that's another one. Uh, here in Columbus, Indiana, uh, it tends to be, if you want to do a residential installation, uh, more advantageous to install a photovoltaic system than, than the other ones. Uh, at the, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about not a, re a residential installation, but a, a grid level installation, something that would power the grid, you have the same types of considerations. Um, what is available to you? And that varies everywhere. Let's just say in Columbus, Indiana, my access to tidal energy is very poor, uh, but there are other types of energy that I have available. Um, and uh, that the same is true for, for each installation you wanna look at. The, so what is your opinion on electric cars and where do you think they're going? Uh, so, so it's important to understand that, that an electric car operates uh, based upon a battery um, it can be fueled either from the grid or from a fuel cell. Uh, a fuel cell car is actually an electric car in the end because what's actually powering the wheels is, is electricity. Uh, you know, from the passenger car perspective, and, and I work both on, you know, I've worked on passenger cars. I was the engine performance team leader for the, the, uh, the Ram heavy duty pickup truck for seven years. So I, that's often used as a passenger car. So I have some experience there, but also work on commercial transportation. And, you know, from a passenger car perspective, electric cars, you know, the, the use case is excellent. Uh, the cars don't weigh very much. They typically don't travel very far. And therefore the amount of energy that you have to store on board is, is relatively limited. Um, and so because batteries don't have very good energy density, a passenger application is um, actually very good. But when it comes to understanding what the climate change impacts of an electric car are, that becomes a little more difficult because if you're charging the car from your, let's say your garage, um, then it really depends on how that electricity was produced. And that varies again by region, like we talked about earlier. Um, in some parts of the country, the electric grid is you know, heavily renewable. Um, in the Pacific Northwest, for example, where they are blessed with um, water resources in the form of, of rivers and blessed with foresight by some uh, committed individuals many decades ago to build large hydroelectric dams. And so they produce a lot of electricity from, uh, from the renewable source of, of, of water running through a river. Then there are other places in the United States where the grid um, is, is not as clean. Um, there are states like my own in the state of Indiana where the vast majority of electricity is produced by the combustion of fossil fuels, either uh, coal or natural gas. When you look at an electric car operating in each of these different regions, its impact on the climate is different. Uh, a heavier impact on the climate for the same car operating the same annual miles in the state of Indiana than it is in the state of Washington. And so over time, uh, this will change. As the US electricity grid evolves, and it is evolving, um, the, the impact of an electric car will, will change. And uh, that's something that we can, we can watch and monitor. And as engineers and scientists, we have data available to us uh, to let us uh, see how that's transforming. So you've talked a little bit about electric cars. What are some other renewable energy and alternative fuel projects out there right now? I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because that allows me to talk about some of my, my favorite renewable uh, energy concepts and, and technologies. I mentioned uh, uh, the solar photovoltaics before. We, we've seen those on homes. Uh, we've seen them uh, at, uh, in grid, grid level installations. These are multi-megawatt uh, installations where you see you know, hundreds, if not thousands of, of uh, solar panels uh, in, installed. Uh, the, 
probably my favorite uh, renewable energy project that I have ob observed so far is, is called the Ivanpah Power Generation Station in, in Southern California. Uh, that installation takes, uh, it's, a, it's a huge installation of mirrors and they've you know, built this over square miles and there's, you know, I, I can't remember how many mirrors, many mirrors, uh, hundreds and hundreds of mirrors, maybe thousands. And they are focusing that uh, the sunlight in that in the, uh, the Gobi Desert onto a central tall tower, and that tower is used to to heat a fluid, and that fluid can, is used to uh, create steam to run a steam turbine. So it's a it's a multi multi hundred megawatt power generating station uh, producing, you know, clean uh, carbonless uh, electricity, and it's just a fantastic example of the types of technology that we have available to us and is being deployed um, uh, for the purpose of, of transforming our uh, transforming our electrical grid. So that's, that's excellent. Uh, my, uh, probably another great example of a, of a forward-looking um, uh, energy project is a, so, some geothermal installations. So geothermal energy uh, is obtained by uh, basically drilling into the earth and sometimes it's referred to as enhanced geothermal meaning you dig a hole and you dig down far enough so that you get access to hot rocks uh, i mentioned hot rocks before but there are places on the earth where you know rocks that are you know much hotter than is required to make steam are available and these are large underground reservoirs of of, of energy that's fed by you know the internal the internal heat of the earth and if you pump water down there and you bring it back up, uh, you can create steam and run a steam turbine and do that with using renewable energy. There's a great example of a project that was done in, uh, in the Australian desert where they only had to drill down a couple of miles, which drilling a couple of miles into the earth is no longer a challenge for, for the, uh, the industries that are, that are out there drilling for oil today. So we can drill wells, uh, drill wells for hot rocks. And I think that's a, a you know an excellent example again of the of the technology we have available to increase the you know the access to to renewable energy. Now, final one is a little bit out there. Um, it's called a solar chimney. Um, a solar chimney you can imagine as a, a a very tall chimney, you know, hundreds of meters perhaps tall, um, where you basically create a a glass structure maybe a meter off the ground. And that feeds into this solar tower. And basically when the air comes underneath this very large glass structure, it heats and gets drawn up through the chimney. And then you can install wind turbines uh, around the perimeter of where it is entering this, this glass dome, if you will. Uh, that's a, there have been a number of demonstration projects built um, from the 40, 40 megawatt size uh, on up. And there are companies uh, here, uh, uh, in the United States and Australia that are trying to commercialize that technology. So these are really creative uh, and exciting uh, applications uh, that you know can be built at grid scale, which is super important. We've got to deliver uh, an amazing amount of energy, uh, which is commensurate with what we consume in order to maintain and develop uh, countries all over the world. So those are some examples of uh, what I think are some pretty interesting projects that are either uh, in the implementation phase are, are already delivering energy to grids. What's one thing I would like to mention, Helen, while we're on that particular subject is the, the difficulty most people have understanding the scale of energy consumption. And, you know, an individual project, putting a few solar panels on my house is an excellent, you know, opportunity to uh, make a contribution to changing, you know, changing the way we live and, and the world around us. But, you know, it's, it's, it's smaller than a drop in a bucket. It's a molecule in a bucket. And, you know, to make uh, the impacts that we really need to have, we've got to have massive, massive deployment of renewable energy. Um, one way to think about this is, you know, a, a, you know a, a fraction of the carbon dioxide that we produce through our energy consumption comes from transportation, from burning gasoline and diesel fuel, which is all derived from, from petroleum, from oil. And the scale of oil consumption is just mind boggling. You know, we're approaching now, this is a number that's just hard to get your mind around, but 
100 million barrels a day of oil globally. 100 million barrels a day globally. It's, it's astonishing. It's, it's, it's not even easy to imagine, but it's massive. Most people don't understand the scale or how tenuous uh, the production of that is. I mean, if you were to turn off all the oil well spigots that were feeding into the U.S., uh, you know, refining capacity to, to produce our, the fuels that we use today, you're looking at, you know, something on the order of a month before all the stored oil is gone. So it's almost hand to mouth on, on, on oil in some ways. And it's done at a massive scale. So this industry is huge and, uh, and supports our way of life. And so as we tr make this transition, uh, it's, it's got to be at a scale that's really hard to, to get our arms around. It's a very difficult problem. And there's going to be a lot of people uh, that have to be you know, contributing to the community, to the technical community, which we, I hope is at least some of the folks on this call coming mm -hmm. in the future. So the title of this is Renewable Energy and Alternative Fuels. What's the difference between renewable energy and alternative fuels and how are they related? Uh, that's great. Good. Um, so renewable energy is really sources, right? I would call it primary sources of energy. Um, you know, you can drill a hole in the ground and, and, and if you're lucky enough, you'll find some oil. That would be a primary source of energy. Uh, a solar panel can, you know, collect sunlight. That's a primary source of energy. Um, you can't drill a hole in the ground and get something like methanol or ethanol. That's not a naturally occurring substance. Um, hydrogen is not a naturally occurring substance as a molecule, at least not in very big quantities. So you got to make it. So, a, you know, it's, it's an energy storage media. An alternative fuel can be considered an energy storage media like ethanol, methanol, hydrogen, you know, in electricity even uh, for that matter. So you know, alternative fuels are forms of energy, whereas renewable energy is a is coming from a primary source, something you can harvest in its in its origin. And from the renewable energy, you make the renewable fuel, or or another word for that would be alternative fuel. So you mentioned hydrogen. Can you tell me a little bit more about that and your opinion on it? Well, I think one of our future speakers may be a, a better source to talk about hydrogen. Uh, NASA uses a lot more of it than I do. Um, hydrogen is a, is a, you know, a, a molecule with fantastic properties. It, it, uh, it has a, a lot of bonuses associated, but with, as with anything, it has its downsides. And so if you're gonna choose to use that for uh, either transportation purposes or home heating or any of those types of things where you might want an alternative energy form, uh, you've got to deal with both the good and the, and the challenging. Uh, it's, it's not very energy dense. You know, if you want to carry a lot of energy, you either have to compress it very, to a very high pressure to be able to contain it in a small enough volume, um, or you have to refrigerate it uh, to liquefy it, to create, make it dense. Um, you know, storing hydrogen is a big challenge. And, um, you know, that's one that, that, the industry has been facing for decades. Um, you know, when I was a, an undergraduate, that was sort of the, my first exposure to enthusiasm about hydrogen um, in the late, in late 1980s. There have been three subsequent peaks in interest in hydrogen. We're in, we're in the fourth of one today. Uh, you know, hydrogen has, uh, you know, you can make it from water. There's a lot of water on the earth. So in principle, it's abundant. Um, but you need a primary source of energy in order to generate it. It's not, it, in and of itself, it's not a primary source of energy. And so you're going to be basically transforming one of the renewable energies that I spoke about earlier into a stored energy form, like, and that would be hydrogen or another alternative fuel. So, you know, hydrogen has its challenges, um, but it, but it, enables some really interesting technologies and enables fuel cells, which are very efficient devices. Um, it enables uh, you to, to create, uh, you know, technologies associated with, with fuel cells, but you've got to be able to store it and you've got to be able to make it, you've got to be able to move it. And those are three really challenging tasks with hydrogen. Um, and, you know, so the industry is working really hard on this. There's, um, you know, development activities, uh, in all aspects of, of my business, which is, is transportation, where they're, uh, we're, we're trying to solve that problem. But uh, hydrogen is a difficult one. And the, the infrastructure associated with hydrogen is a super difficult challenge. Um, 
because of the, 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 the expense that has to be incurred to first make it and then to store and, dis, and distribute it. So uh, it, it really you know, comes down to a, to a cost analysis and how much is there another way? Um, and all these are active questions today. There are people working on it every day um, right now uh, to try to solve that problem. And uh, it's going to be very interesting. You know, my career probably will not, um, you know, that problem will not be fully solved within my career. We'll see. You now, depends on how long I can hang around. But uh, it's, it's, it's certainly an exciting technology. And, and we look forward to seeing uh, how, you know, maybe some of the folks on the phone help us solve it. So kind of off of that, what are the most promising alternative fuels in your opinion? Well, I, I like energy storage forms that are dense, where you can carry a lot of energy in a, in a small amount of weight or a small amount of volume. And, you know, Mother Nature had, you know, hundreds of millions of years, if not billions of years to figure out how to store energy efficiently. And she selected a hydrocarbon bond. Um, you know, that's, that is the, you know, when you go out and you look at the biology uh, that's out there, whether it's the carbohydrates that are making up the biomass that, you know, plants, leaves, um, you know, that's, that's how the energy is stored in a hydrocarbon bond. So things like the alcohols I mentioned earlier, which are, you know, methanol and ethanol are very good. Um, there are renewable forms of higher hydrocarbons, um, like renewable gasoline or renewable diesel. Those are, no, those are options as well. I think you know, the, your, the US Department of Energy just published a, a four year long study trying to determine you know, what would be the best fuel moving forward for transportation. They, they narrowed it down from thousands of options, thousands of different molecules to just a handful, you know, four or five and things like ethanol were on that list, which we already make in the billions of gallons. Um, it has really nice properties, but there are other ways to make it uh, that have an even lower impact um, uh, on our environment than we currently do today. And, and that's, you know, likely what we'll see is something down that, that path in the shorter term, I would say in the 20 to 40 years. That's my personal opinion. And so kind of to end things off, for students who are interested in alternative fuels and renewable energy, how can they learn more and get involved? Well, the, the first thing to understand about, you know, alternative fuels and, and, all, and, and renewable energy is, is your energy. How much energy do you consume and in what forms? Um, you know, I, I was thinking about maybe you should just go home and ask your parents to give you their utility bill, you know, their natural gas bill or their or their electrical bill and see how much energy your home is consuming. That's a good place to start to understand, you know, what your impact is and, and actually how it's measured because unfortunately, commercially, all these, all these forms of energy are, are bought and sold in, in different units. So, you know, just kind of figure out how much you use. But then, you know, I, I think it's really interesting. All, I mean, all the folks that are on this call have the opportunity to go out and do projects that um, would demonstrate to them you know, how this stuff works in a basic way. Like, for example, how about solarizing your robot? I mean, we basically make electric cars in the first family of programs. And those cars can be charged by uh, photovoltaic panels. And you know, there are actually college competitions for producing a solar car. So why not a solar-based robot? I think that would be a really interesting project. You know, do you do it at the FRC size or a smaller size? Uh, all of those things are possible. Uh, how about building a wind turbine? Um, I encourage everyone to go out and read the book, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. There's an example of someone that took a uh, creative license and the materials that were available around them and, and built a wind turbine that actually you know, made a difference in their life. And it's a great way to you know, explore that. It's not that difficult. You have all the tools uh, available to you uh, from, in, from the first community to be able to do such a thing. Um, another project that I really like that would give you an opportunity to explore is a solar oven. So these are kind of home projects you could do, or maybe part of your team is an off-season project. Uh, explore how to build a solar oven. I mean, collect sunlight, focus it, and turn it into something that can, that can cook. These are things that, you know, the internet's an amazing thing, and you can find a lot of information about how to do all those things. And they're possible with all the tools that they've been, been learning uh, through their exploration 
of uh, science and technology in first. Thank you, Sam. I think that's about all for today. Did we use up? Did we use up all our time? We did, and it was a fascinating subject. I I really liked the um, Sam how you differentiate between the renewable and the alternative sources uh, of energy, but I also like that one simple idea that where we should start is see how much energy you're consuming, uh, and uh, I think that's a that's right now with being at home uh, for us of the school year is something students could do. They could measure the and try different things. Maybe try turning out the lights certain parts of the day when the sun's out and, and see over a period of a couple of months, can they affect, maybe swap out light bulbs for LED or see if they can have an effect on it? You know, the, the, the utility that provides electricity for my home, you know, publishes my hourly data to me. I can log into, their, into a website where they, you know, track my history. So I could, you know, try to make my morning tomorrow more efficient than my morning was today. Well, that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much, uh, um, Helen. Thank you, uh, 4926 Galactech. Uh, appreciate uh, you spending some time with us and sharing this uh, great science uh, conversation and being a part of our, our uh, FIN virtual conference. We're gonna transition now to our next conversation. So yeah, again, thanks again. And uh, we're gonna move on to fundraising tips for teams. We've got a, a panel who should be unmuting and uh, turning their cameras on if they haven't already. I'm gonna put us in gallery view here real quick so we can uh, see the folks who are joining us. We've got uh, with us, uh, Carissa Renner is gonna be joining us. Uh, um, uh, actually, so what, I, what I'll actually do is maybe just have you introduce yourself. So how's that? Cause you can tell us who you are and what your background, like what level of, of first you've been a part of. Uh, and and just kind of start the whole panel conversation from there. So Carissa, why don't you start us off and then I'll just go around the room. Sure. I'm Carissa Renner. Um, I am a four-year coach now with First Lego League. And, um, we do all of our um, support through fundraising. Okay. Kathy, you want to tell us a little bit about you? Sure. Hi. Um, I am a first volunteer, 19 years this year. Um, and I've done a variety of different things from being a mentor on an FRC team to the FTC program um, lead in Connecticut and uh, also was the co-founder and director of NEMO, the non-engineering mentor organization for 14 years. So I have a lot of experience of helping teams from all FIRST programs with fundraising. Great, Nathan. Yeah, so uh, I'm Nathan Petrie. Uh, I was on FRC team 135 uh, for Mishawaka, Indiana for two years. And now I help FRC 6956 uh, and on both teams, um, but on 135, I was the budget and like sponsor contact manager uh, for the team. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. Okay, great. And Madison. Hi, so I'm Madison Henderson. Um, I'm in AmeriCorps Vista with First Indiana Robotics. So I've been on a little over six months um, and I am new to First. I haven't been on a team um, and I haven't directly, you know, mentored a team or volunteered. Well, that's not true. I, I volunteered for our Bloomington event um, last month. But I have learned kind of the fundraising process through our um, president, Renee becker Blau. Um, but I'm here to kind of Here's some first-hand experience and hopefully ask a lot of good questions to kind of get to the nitty-gritty of uh, effective fundraising. Great. Well, I'm really excited that we've got a real good cross-program group. Um, I think even at the FLL junior level, which we don't really have, we don't have uh, representation there, there's fundraising at every level of FIRST. Um, and I think the concepts that we're going to hear about today uh, really could be util probably utilized at any level. Um, now, I, I know there's a big difference between asking for $5 or $5,000. Um, so uh, with that, we've got the, the panel set up. Um, Carissa, I don't know if you had some things prepared. Um, we could, since you're, uh, we'll start with FLL. Um, if you had some prepared things you want to share with us. Yes, I do. So um, 
last year was our first year um, doing big fundraising. Um, our we're FF, FLL team based out of Granger, Indiana, and we have four boys on our team. And um, they decided last year because the theme was into orbit. Hey, let's fly to Houston because we want to go to the space station down in Houston. We want to go, you know, see it all. So we said, great, we're not paying for it. How are you going to do this? And so they went door to door and sold fall mums and raised over $3,000 to pay for our flights and experiences that we had down in Houston for, um, we were there from Thursday through Saturday. Um, and we had a fabulous time and they um, got to meet some astronauts and it was an amazing experience. And so then we thought this was um, our first really well organized year was last year, even though it was our third year doing it. And um, they decided they made it past their qualifying tournament and they made it to state and then they won second place in the state of Indiana and we're going on to Arkansas and we went, great, we need more money. What are you going to do now? So they, um, our local um, grocery store, Martin Supermarket, um, allows you to um, nonprofit organizations to sell coupon book booklets. So our team went door to door and sold over 1,225 coupon booklets by knocking on doors, $5 each. But last season they raised over $14,000 total to pay for our entire trip to Arkansas, including the City Museum in St. Louis, the Sights and Sound Theater, Houston. I mean, they paid for everything, but it was over $14,000 um, through Fall Mums, through Martin's Coupon Booklets. Um, they did a Nelson's um, Chicken Fundraiser. Those from Indiana are probably familiar with Nelson's. You can do one to $2,000 worth in a Saturday through Nelson's Chicken, it's fabulous. Um, we also worked with um, Culver's, um, Hacienda, Chick-fil-A, Five Guys, and did several give back nights where we got money that way as well. So last year we did have two, a couple sponsors that we had as well who gave us each $1,000, but the rest of it they're raised. So this year we thought, okay, we did 14,000 last year. Um, we don't need sponsors this year. So they have worked very hard and they raised all the money themselves. Um, just going door to door with moms again and with coupon booklets. Um, we did a um, Nelson's about a month ago before the quarantine started to raise money for next year um, since all the stuff has been canceled for this year. Um, and so, yeah, we, we believe it's part of their learning process. And when you look at, they sold over a thousand coupon books how many rejections did they get and what kind of life skills did that teach them about persistence and um, yeah, work, hard work. And so first Lego league is not just about robots. It's about the whole package and fundraising is a definite part of that package. So that's fantastic. Um, and just also real quick uh, joining us also is Chris Woodard. Uh, Chris, you want to introduce yourself real quick? Um, tell us a little bit about your background. Oh, I'll unmute you. There you go. Does it, it's working now. There we go. So my name is Chris Woodard. I've been involved in FIRST for roughly 10 years. Um, started in FLL and then have also been working in FRC with 3559 Go Thundercats. And also FTC, um, I'm a coach with FTC and then currently coach uh, four FLL teams. So I, yeah. fundraising is definitely one of those things that is not my forte. And so I try to listen as much as I can to learn as much as I can. Yeah, and we'll have, uh, Chris, we'll have you maybe in a few minutes uh, talk about kind of a unique uh, fundraiser that um, uh, Jasper, uh, the Thundercats 3559 out of Jasper High School. Uh, Chris teaches at Lagodi, which is a nearby community, um, all down in Southwest Indiana. Uh, so I think, Nathan, you had some slides you were going to share with us. Yeah, I do. And talk a little bit about the 135 approach and a yes. few other pieces. Okay, great. So I'll do that. I sold those same. 
coupon books, by the way, when I was on an <laughs> FTC team. I'm not, I, we needed to raise some money. So I was like, oh, Martin's does this cool thing. Let's do that. So fabulous. Yep. Uh, okay. Let's see here. So can everyone see my screen at least? Yeah. Yes. All right. Yes. Cool. So I just prepared like a, some slides here um, about how I did things on 135. It's not necessarily how they still do it. It's just like uh, the process that I created um, to use on the years that I was on the team, which is 2016 and 2017. Uh, I forgot to mention that I also work for First Indiana Robotics as a development intern, and I just started like in February. So, all right. So nice. first, uh, I was going to talk about like um, building a database uh, like of sponsors. So gathering, you know, the data. Where do you start like looking for sponsors? Um, and one of the you know first things you should start out with is like your you know very local community, like parents, family. Uh, like, do your parents own companies? Do they work for companies that are willing to donate? You want to get all the information you can. Um, you know, just go on Google Maps. Uh, this is, you know, Northeast Indy. I just searched engineering and, you know, just see all these. And obviously, engineering companies are not the only companies that support first teams. I was just like giving an example. Um, another great resource is uh, Chamber of Commerce websites uh, for different cities. So like, you know, Indianapolis, their website's great. You just go on to membership, member directory, and you can search by category, get a contact info for different companies. Um, obviously, really great to find companies that are around your high school or wherever your team meets or whatever uh, that would, you know, might be willing to sponsor you. Uh, and so then you kind of got to know, like, what do I actually need to gather uh, about these sponsors? So, you know, obviously, just basic contact info, um, address, uh, business hours is something I found to be useful. Uh, so that way, um, you know when to call them. Uh, you're not calling them when they're closed or, you know, when they're about to close because that's the worst time for anyone who's working to get a call. Um, and you also want to know, like, if they're a previous sponsor, how much they donated in the past. Uh, and so now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, customer relationship management software. So obviously, for teams that may not, like, for FLL and FTC, you may not have like tons of sponsors, but an FRC team may have a lot of sponsors and they may need somewhere to you know, document them all easily. Uh, that isn't just a spreadsheet. Um, so a customer relationship management software is a software to help manage customer interactions. Um, and it doesn't just have to be sponsors. Um, it can be like grants you're writing, fundraisers you're doing, Nelson's Chicken, Martin's Coupon Books, whatever, or really any process on your team that goes through, you know, separate stages. Um, you, many of them like work by moving your customers to like campaigns. Um, it's like what Salesforce calls it. Pipelines is what uh, Streak calls it, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, and, you know, it just makes sure you contact all the sponsors, follow up, uh, get as much money as possible. So um, the software that we used at Penn High School was Streak. Uh, it's an integration uh, into Gmail. Uh, so it's just a Google Chrome add-on. It's free. There are paid plans available uh, that can add, like, more features. And it's great for teams that already use Gmail. I mean, if you don't, it's still super easy to set up. Um, and it's basically just a fancy spreadsheet. Um, like it, it looks exactly like a spreadsheet just with, uh, you know, you move the sponsors through the pipelines. So I wasn't able to get a picture of what our system looked like exactly, but I just got a picture off the internet here. But basically what you do is you create these pipelines, which look like this um, up at the top here of the picture. Uh, and they, that's how you track uh, the sponsor through the sponsor process. So each pipeline has stages. And so that's each one of these wedges in the pipeline. And then each sponsor is a row in this software. So you create a pipeline uh, you know, for your current year. And then you add stages to it, like previous sponsor, prospective sponsor. And that's where they start. And then you move them into the different stages of like the sponsor contact process that we used. You could also make like a pipeline for each process if your processes were like, you know, really big. So like, let's say you had, you know, made letters for them, but you wanted to track which ones had letters made, which ones had envelopes printed, which ones were printed, which ones were sent, you know, et cetera. So then comes into like contacting those sponsors and actually using uh, the spreadsheet or, you know, streak. 
Um, so what you will always want to do is, unless this is like your rookie year, you want to contact your previous sponsors first. Um, most likely if they donated before or if they've donated, you know, the past five years, they're going to donate again. Uh, so you want to contact them first and then that way you can sort of figure out where you are financially. Um, and then, so it's a great idea to have like two different letters, one for your previous sponsors and one for your prospective sponsors. Um, and you want to create this letter on like school or team letterhead. Uh, we made our own letterhead and like put little pictures on the side of our team and stuff. Uh, and you just want to include like different information about your program, about what first is, um, how your past season or seasons have gone, uh, what you do throughout the season, and you know most importantly what the money is going to be used for. So like they're not just giving you money for nothing. Uh, and you want to begin the letter like in the first paragraph uh, with you know who you are, like what your name is, where you're from, and then you want to ask for the money. Um, we were always specific with amounts uh, because we kind of judged it by the size of the company, uh, but you don't necessarily have to. Um, it just sort of gives an idea of you know what uh, we're looking for. Like especially with the FRC team, I would always put like uh, I would do a budget forecast, which we'll talk about later, and I would put the number in that we were expecting we needed to raise to really show the need for the money. Uh, then you want to print labels for the envelopes. That's how I always did it. I would you know put all the uh, addresses in a spreadsheet, throw them into a mail merge and print off the uh, envelopes. And then, you know, you just want to make sure they look good. Uh, you don't want it to look, I mean, obviously there's something maybe for FLL, like you may want it, you know, to look like the kids are doing like this, you know, fun stuff or, you know, I don't know, I guess it would probably depend on the level, uh, sort of what you want to show the sponsor, uh, the professionalism of the team. Um, and then you send them and document uh, however you choose. So like using streak. So um, then you want to like make a phone call. So we would always wait uh, about four days uh, for business days to make sure they got the letter. Um, we were contacting a lot of smaller companies. So it's not like, you know, their letter went to some office and we were calling some office across the country. So we, you know, we would just wait. And then most of the time, the money would be made on the phone call. Uh, they wouldn't just send you a check from the letter unless they were a previous sponsor. Um, then they would usually, you know, if they knew, oh, we get a letter every time of every year at this time of year, we'll send the check. Uh, you want to have a script ready. Um, you know, you want to ask who you're speaking with first off, you know, say who you are, say what you're representing. Uh, and then you want to have like different routes you can take in your um, script based on what they say, who you're talking to, et cetera. Uh, and if they say yes, you know, you want to send an email. Uh, if they don't answer, you know, you want to document it no matter what. Uh, so that way you can follow up if they didn't answer or, you know, if they said, you know, I need you to talk to this person, you can call that person in a couple of days or whatever. Uh, some other things, you know, you should have ready. Uh, you should have like an invoice template ready. Uh, that way you can email it right while you're on the phone. Um, because some companies require, require it. I put an example of the one I made uh, for 135 over to the right. Uh, and you want to have email templates. Um, should be your last resort for cold contacting. Uh, you should be, you know, making a personal connection. And um, it could be as the same as your letter, though. Uh, and then you want to have, like, a confirmation email template. And you want to be able to document all those emails. And then everyone contacting sponsors should know very, you know, at least this information about the team, which would be the address, uh, your phone number, your team's email address, where to send checks, and who to make them out to. The where to send checks and who to make them out to is like most important. You need everyone to know that info. So after you make the donation, um, or after the company makes a donation, you want to keep track of sponsor benefits. Uh, so sponsors should receive something in return for their support. I mean, that depends on how your team wants to do things. Uh, but every sponsor should at least get a thank you letter um, because, you know, you want to, they want to make sure that you got the check. They want to make sure you're, you know, grateful for the check. Um, and then it also acts as a receipt, uh, you know, for their tax purposes. Um, I, I assume most teams already do this sort of thing uh, with, you know, different tiers of sponsorship. So like, if you donate two hundred dollars, you get this stuff and et cetera. So there's some like examples here. This is a spreadsheet I used to track uh, what sponsor benefits had been done. So like 
you know, making sure we sent the thank you letter, that they were put on the website, that we sent them a certificate, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, it was color coordinated based on what they had, what we needed to give to them. So like these three didn't have their name on the robot yet. Uh, and you want to assign it to students to do, um, you know, obviously if your team doesn't have the resources, that's okay, but it shouldn't really be, you know, the mentors writing thank you letters to um, sponsors, you know, it should be signed by a student uh, just so the money, you know, they can show, hey, this went to helping these students out. So I just want to talk really quick about uh, managing the budget of like a FRC team and how I did it. Um, so we always made a budget forecast at the beginning of the year. Uh, actually, I didn't put a forecast of income. Uh, and that's something I would have done if I was doing it now. Uh, and you want to do like what expenses you expect. So that way you could get some sort of operating budget. Uh, that budget can be given to sponsors, you know, and then you should also present it to the team uh, as a proposal uh, so that you can discuss, like, if you see on here, there's like fall expenses, including shop and fall projects. Like, should we be budgeting $3,500 for that or a robot cost of $10,000? Like, how many robots do we want to build, you know, et cetera. Uh, and then you want to track your income and expenses. This is really important for the business uh, or the entrepreneurship award. Um, and I didn't really talk about profit and loss statements anywhere in this, uh, but that's gone over pretty well in the award description. Uh, but you need this documentation in order to assemble profit and the profit and loss statement. Um, so this just kind of shows, you know, basics. I mean, it's who we paid or who paid us and the date, the description and the amount. So uh, this is how you um, how I did the tracking of orders. So I had a form that students, teachers, mentors, whatever would fill out, uh, however they wanted to, you know, what sub team it went to, vendor amount, the PO number from the school, et cetera. Uh, and then we could refer to those internal order numbers in our spreadsheets. Uh, so that way I didn't have to like write an invoice number description in every line item uh, in the cash flow spreadsheet. And then uh, I would print this, attach it to the receipts. Uh, that way I could track how much was left on our open purchase orders because the school would give us $500 to spend at Andy Mark. And once I went over that $500, the secretary would get super mad. So I had to make sure that we didn't go over that. Um, and then also have some sort of form to fill out um, you know, for reimbursements. Uh, so it also gives like some cool metrics about like how much you spent on, you know, software controls, uh, you know, there's 16 orders for that, uh, or like which vendors you order from most. So like we ordered the most from Vex, McMaster, and Andy Mark. Uh, and just like a little last thing um, was, it was very helpful to have uh, a 501c3 set up for the team, uh, which was the Pen Robotics parent organization. Um, and basically that way we could hold money in a bank account and use a card, have PayPal, 501c3, tax deductible donations, all that fun stuff. So, yep, that's all I have. So thank you. Well, th thank you, Nathan. That's a uh, really pretty amazing presentation. And I've seen uh, your group do their presentation at the Purdue forums. Uh, I think uh, 135 tends to do their, their uh, sponsorship presentation every year at forums uh, at Purdue. You get a chance to go. I definitely highly recommend it. Uh, check out the links. I did put a couple of links on the uh, Twitch chat. We did have a question come in um, regarding, um, it was directed at, at our FLL uh, person was, um, when you did all this fundraising, did you have a nonprofit, Carissa, that you were associated with or that you created or working through? We were working through a non -for nonprofit. Mm -hmm. so okay. Our donations went there and then we would just turn in receipts. Um, if I don't know. Um, we kept a spreadsheet like Nathan talked about. Um, and so if we had big companies who donated, then it went to our nonprofit. Otherwise, like our coupon books, I just cash flowed that. And um, then I could go out and buy our posters or we could, I could just use my credit card and buy our tickets and um, the Martin's money paid for that or the Nelson's money paid for that. So it's probably not technically the way you're supposed to do it, but it worked for us for the past couple of years. Okay, great. Yeah, I think the big one of the big things that I a, a good takeaway from from Nathan from the tracking that they're doing for me anyway, and the 
important piece is how are we thanking our sponsors and how are we yes. thanking our, our donors in general? Uh, and because uh, the number one reason uh, that people stop giving to a cause is because they weren't thanked appropriately. And so by tracking this and, and uh, even in a, even on a spreadsheet, you could still create those tiers um, that, uh, that Nathan had talked about. So what we would do is if we did ask for a sponsor, go, we had a presentation we would give at the FLL level and the boys would do it. They'd ask for money. We'd take a picture of our sponsor with our team and then we would print that picture and have the boys write a thank you note, everybody signs it, and then we would send that back to that person. Or like for our um, Nelson's or Martin's coupon booklets, we even took a picture with them holding fall mums, wrote a thank you note and sent it to our place where we got the mums from. We sent it to Martin's, we sent it to Nelson's, just to try to, like Nathan said, follow up with that. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Um, Kathy, I was gonna have you, uh, you had a couple of thoughts, some uh, some ideas that you were going to share with us, uh, and then uh, we'll we'll have you share some stuff, and then we'll uh, we'll talk to Chris a little bit about one the kind of fun, unique thing that Jasper's done, but then also some of his other experience with uh, some of the fundraising he's done. So, what are some of the thoughts you have for us, Kathy? Okay, so since I have worked for a long time with a variety of teams in all of the programs, um, I have come across a lot of problems the teams have had. And so I just jotted down some of the things that I thought would be important to share that you might wanna consider um, if you're new to this, or if you're, uh, even if you're a veteran, you might not have thought of some of these things. Um, so this is kind of a random list. I apologize, it's not organized real well, but um, it's part of a rookie team uh, data dump, we used to call it in Connecticut, where I'm from, um, that we would give to rookie teams at the very beginning as they were forming their teams, things to be thinking about. So um, when we're talking about fundraising, as you all know, we're not just talking about sponsors, as Nathan was just describing, but also um, writing grants, doing those door-to-door -door sales, coupon books, or, or um, shake a can at the grocery store, or whatever, but also in-kind donations, which can really help out a lot. Um, I always urged teams to make a wish list and keep it updated and include things on it, large items, expensive items, and very inexpensive items. Anything, let's say, from a 3D printer to a whiteboard and markers because you never know who might have something that they're willing to donate to the team. Um, maybe they can't make a financial donation, but they've got markers sitting in their desk at, at, at their um, office that they can donate. Um, and then keep that wish list with you and hand it out at all of the events, the outreach events that you're participating in. Um, we have found over the years that a lot of things come in that way that you don't necessarily want to spend your hard-earned fundraising dollars on. Um, so in-kind donations are, are really huge. Um, also, um, fundraising varies with each team based on how your team has been organized. So if you're um, an independent, a non-school affiliated team, you probably might want to look into a 501c3, 501c4 designation where you have more autonomy over your fundraising and where your dollars are going and how you access them. Uh, if you're a public school affiliated team, you might have to follow some school guidelines as to what you can do for fundraising and where the money is going to go. Be aware of other teams in your school that are doing fundraisers so you don't step over them. You know, if someone else is already doing the coupon fundraiser, obviously that won't work for you. You'll have to think of something different. Um, and there's also be thinking in terms of how many things can someone buy? For example, um, in Connecticut, we had entertainment books, and I'm not familiar here in Indiana enough to know whether you have those here, but basically a family can only use one entertainment book. So that it's, you know, if, if somebody else is already selling that, you're not going to have luck with that. Um, you also might want to be um, aware of where your funds are going if you are uh, affiliated with a public school 
do they go into a special account just for the team to access or um, and how quickly can you get those funds out of that account? You know, if it's a long 90 day process through the school system, that's not gonna help you when you need to purchase something quickly. And then also, um, does it go, do your team's funds that you've earned go into a general fund for the school system, which is one of the problems my team had at one year. Um, our funds went into a general fund and they were accessed to fund school field trips for classrooms instead of coming back to us, which we discovered after the fact. So these are all things that you need to be asking your school administrators. And if you're a privately uh, private school affiliated team, that's another whole set of um, possible issues. It's been my experience that most private schools will not allow their students to fundraise and that any fundraising that is done goes back to the school itself versus going to an individual team. So these are all things that you want to be thinking about um, as, your, as, as your team is organizing and then as you're moving forward with your fundraising plans. Um, there are different models for fundraising that I found. Some, sometimes uh, all the funds earned by your team are gonna go into a general team budget, which pays for everything, um, such as your parts, travel, website costs, whatever it might be, um, they all go into one general fund. Another model is where uh, students are credited for any funds that they earn for the team, which then might go to offset their own travel expenses. So for example, if the team estimates it's gonna be, let's say $800 to travel to an event for your hotel, food, bus, whatever it might be, um, the student needs to earn $800 to pay back that bill. Or if the parents don't want the student to be doing fundraising, participating in that, then they may wish to pay that themselves independently. Um, you might wanna also check to see, oh, some, some teams also do pay to play. That's another model that has become popular, um, especially with larger teams I, I found. So they may charge, a certain fee to in order to join the team. Um, and then th you wanna think about things like, um, are mentors travel expenses going to be paid by the team or are mentors responsible for doing fundraising and paying also? So those are things to think about. Um, also on the downside of things, sorry, a uh, <laughs> little negativity here, but you also wanna make sure um, to protect yourselves. So who can sign your checks? Do you have a two person system in place for signing those checks, which can help uh, sort of prevent any kind of um, misuse of funds, shall we say? Uh, it just kind of is a, is a good way to do things. Um, who can order parts? Do they have to get another person sign off on that before they can place an order if you need something quickly? Who books your travel? And who makes those kinds of decisions? Who's the, the ultimate decision maker on spending those funds? Obviously keep your receipts. If you're buying anything for your team and you wanna get reimbursed, you need to keep those receipts. And it's really, really helpful if you um, only purchase things for the team on one receipt I think I said that backwards, but in other words, don't go to the store and buy things for your own selves and for the team and have one receipt. It's just make it easier, just pay for them separately. Um, one thing that we had a real hard time with in Connecticut was a team many, many years ago that was folding. And um, we needed to determine where the assets were going to be distributed. So as you are purchasing things or as things are being donated to your teams, we came up with a form that people could fill out that indicated whether the item they were donating, an in-kind donation kind of thing or whatever it might be that they purchased for the team, um, was something that was being donated to the team and was not expected to be returned. Or was it something that was more or less on loan to the team? And so that if, a mentor purchased uh, a widget and decided that when that mentor left, their student or their son or daughter left the team and so they retired off the team as well, did they get the widget back? Um, the, these have created a lot of 
legal problems. And so it's really a good idea. I think you're required if you're a 501c3 to figure out how you're gonna distribute assets. But it's also just a good standard operating procedure for all teams, because we're talking about a lot of tools, a lot of equipment, um, things like that that can be donated over time, laptops, things like that, that you just wanna make sure that they will belong to the team or they'll get returned properly if that was what was, um, what was initially thought. Um, oh, one more thing, if you're going to be doing a fundraiser like a pasta dinner, which was very popular, uh, a pancake breakfast or something like that, um, make, don't just hold a pasta dinner, make it an experience. If you notice today, things like Disney World has roller coaster rides, but they don't call them roller coaster rides. They have Thunder Mountain and they have Space Mountain and, and everything is done around a theme. And, and um, most retailers today, uh, particularly retailers like Anthropology, uh, sell on a theme. And so they make it an experience to go shopping in their stores. You wanna make a pasta dinner an experience that someone is going to remember and want to come back to the following year. So um, you have Italian music playing in the background and you have candles on the tables and, and things like that to really make it something memorable. You also, don't forget, these are fantastic photo ops. Invite your sponsors. Um, if your sponsor is going to give you a thousand dollar donation, don't just accept the check. Make one of those large checks like they use for the lottery winners and turn this into a photo op and make sure that the company's um, marketing department is there taking photos and so that gets publicized and you have your robot accept the big check. This is how you can enhance something that is otherwise just a pasta dinner. Um, and then also one last tip for me is uh, if at all possible, can you get if you can get your teams together virtually like this on, on a call, um, share your best fundraising ideas. Every team has one fundraising the idea that has worked great for them and share it with the other teams. And, and we have found over the years um, when Nemo was in existence that our meetings were so popular because it was the sharing of these types of ideas between teams. We share a lot of our ideas on the technical side, but we tend to forget to share them for things like fundraisers. And that's all I have today. Well, Kathy, thank you. That's a lot. Um, I was taking some pretty copious notes here. I'm going to try to type some of this stuff up. Maybe you and I can share uh, an email or two. We'll get some of these ideas um, out onto our website on our resources page. Great. Uh, I think because there's some really good things here for teams, especially uh, I like the fact that you you talked about some things to be careful about. And, and that's some that's some good stuff. I and mean, there are some links, uh, some things that we can also put on to how, you know, what are some good financial practices and risk management? So we'll get some of that stuff out there. Uh, Chris Woodard from uh, down Southwest Indiana. Chris, uh, I think you know what I wanted you to share with us, the unique little fundraiser that uh, you guys do down in Jasper, but also just maybe some other things in general that you guys have done. Okay, I will do the best I can. And then if I forget anything, let me know. Um, I did have two items that I want to, to share real quick. One, I was curious, Nathaniel, um, is it possible if you can share your PowerPoint at some point with me? Yes. Uh, yeah, and we'll put it on our website too. I'll get it shared with Chris, yep. Great, great. Um, the other one too for, the, for Carissa, and I think this is in general. Now the 501c3 can be kind of laborious. One other idea that's floated out there, if a FLL team specifically, um, are looking for some way to be not part of a school, they're maybe a home team or something. Um, I have seen them use Cub Scouts or Boy Scouts as an umbrella to be a nonprofit. So they, they make themselves a little troop and the six of them are a Boy Scout troop and now they're a nonprofit and then essentially they're their own money, right? So uh, Chris, one item I did have, I do have a PowerPoint if you'd like me to kind of flip through that with uh, what we do there at Lagodi and the manufacturing side. Sure. Do you know how to share your screen? I'm gonna work on that. Let's see if it works. Okay. 
as he's doing that, I think also uh, tying that to, oh yeah, there we go. There's the screen. Um, really not only in uh, scouting, but really there's a lot of different nonprofits in communities, uh, community foundations, et cetera, that you could uh, link to. So we lost your audio, but we have your screen. There we go. I think we're good now. All right. Okay. So I'm going to run through this. This is not, uh, this is more like to present to sponsors. And so it's a little bit long. So I will be going through it fairly quick. So um, at Lagodi High School, we went ahead and we started a um, student run business. And you'll see the student run business and how that folds into robotics is a lot of the team members in the student run business are also on the robotics team. And some of the item, a lot of the items that the student run business uses is also part of the robotics team. And so you kind of see it, it all married together in the end. So this is where we started, as you can see, um, very small facilities, but we did have a CNC machine. And then we partnered with local businesses. So why we did the manufacturing is to teach the students the value of engineering and manufacturing, All right? So how does Lion Manufacturing do this? By running a student-run business. Now, these manufactured goods are for the local businesses. We're lucky here in Southern Indiana that we have quite a bit of manufacturing and I've gone out, the students have gone out to these manufacturing facilities and worked with them closely to say, what can we do for you? We also work student side on the, you might say the, the soft skills, showing up, be respectful, pay it forward, work hard, be positive, get along, be flexible, get grit, join the club, keep learning. The students also have some goals, right? Learn new skills, increase efficiency, more income, become well known to the public and improve time management. So we go ahead and we take students that apply to be part of line manufacturing. Students can't just sign up for this class. And this is a, a one, one period class. They apply to this class and then we interview them and then we decide if they're gonna come in or not come in. Here's some of the pieces that we've been making over the last year and a half. Um, this one here, I believe you guys can see my cursor, right? So this one here on the left is ultimately part of a Navy radar assembly. These ones are also part of that Navy radar assembly. And these ones here, they get used in um, the Bedford area and stone cutting equipment. And they're the, the teeth of a very large chainsaw that cuts stone. So here's our facilities before we uh, got started. Then we did a lot of uh, renovations. And now we have a Haas VF1, we have a Haas mini mill, and the place looks a whole lot better. Okay. So we've got here is a, a video of the of the Lion program. That is correct. Showing the different pieces there of uh, students working on things. Now, did the students also make that video? Yes, the students made the video. Okay. 
And again, about half the students involved in line manufacturing are also part of a uh, robotics team. So now what's not included in this video and I'll, I'll finish it up here. So, you know, seen by the community, we hold different presentations with our sponsors, with the community to understand what we are. Uh, we've been able to make several different news programs. We had Congressman Bouchon, uh, Senator, and um, the nice part for us making these pieces also is the big part for our local area is that, yeah, a lot of our students go into employ in the local area. So that's a big benefit for both our sponsors and our students, but specifically to the, F, um, the first community. So we're able to sponsor four FLL teams and an FTC team. And then next year we're looking at being able to sponsor also an FRC team. And so this has been a really big help to us with tooling, equipment, and then also the knowledge, right? So most of these high school students here also do the line manufacturing. So they get not only the engineering classes I teach them, but the manufacturing classes of how to make different items, welding, machining. And so of course that just folds right back into making robots. And this spring or over the last year, we've worked with a local manufacturer making a pick and place robot. And so we, we were very excited about it. The plan was to be done this May but now it looks like that's gonna be pushed back to fall. But it's been a great experience for the robotics team making this pick and place robot for industry. And then also for getting mentors very interested in helping us out too. So uh, we also support um, FFA and the, um, the more ag side of our CTE department. And last but not least, typically a student will make about $150 a quarter doing this. So a they'll take home $300 a semester for running these machines during the day. So like that, that's, that's been a lot of fun. Um, when I was a student many years ago, I was the student in a student run manufacturing facility. And so that was one of the things, like I said, that I was able to bring here to Lagodi. That's fantastic. Um, so that that takes uh, kind of fundraising to the next level where the team in the school is actually uh, making something to sell to uh, businesses uh, in the area and at the same time gaining those uh, job skills. Uh, I do I do appreciate it too, like as Carissa said that, you know, by going door to door, uh, you know, the the life skill of being told no um, and having to deal with rejection and, and persevering. We hear a lot usually from our, from, especially like from our scholarship providers that um, perseverance is so important in college that that's one of the things that they've seen in our students is that they, they have persevered. Um, so uh, we've got about 10, 12 minutes uh, left. Um, that was a really great piece there. Chris, um, I think, I don't know if you know, I, if you wouldn't mind telling us about the very unique fundraiser that the Jasper team has done in the past. Okay. Um, I don't know I've if they did it this year, but, but this yeah, is a fun I, one really I I see. any team at any level could do. Yes. Okay. So the, the unique fundraiser I think he's talking about there is our Flamingo fundraiser. And so what we do there is that we have flocks of flamingos that the students take around they place in different people's yards. Then on the um, paperwork, it states what your different options are with that, that you can go ahead and you can have them immediately removed. Typically we ask for a donation if you want that of say 10 or $15. Many of our uh, people that find flocks in their yard find it more amusing though to immediately have them removed and sent to another address and that that's $25. So we, we have a lot of fun with that. Yeah, I think now, um, did you guys get into the business of selling flock insurance at one point? Yes, and, and you can get flock <laughs> insurance. 
So I think that the flock insurance is another $5. And with flock insurance, you can make sure that the flocks do not come back to you, at least for a year, because they are migrating birds. You know, they will come oh. back every year. And um, now, of course, there is also a checkoff box. And typically, we do see maybe one in 20 homes that don't have such a sense of humor. Mm. Um, the, the end phone number is always apparent, right? And so if you do have a, a house that's calling that doesn't have a <laughs> sense of humor, we want a parent to be able to answer that call. But what the parent will do is they'll get the call, oh, please, please move this to Johnny Smith's house at 123 Main Street. And then that parent will text out to the different people that are involved, the different students that are involved. And then those students over the next day will make sure that those flocks move. And then that parent also keeps an Excel sheet. And so everyone knows where these flocks are going to, whose house is at it. Um, sometimes the houses do need to have the flock move just because, yeah, the people never call, never do anything. You're never sure if they're home or what, right? Right. That, uh, so there's a couple of questions and I figured there would be. Yeah. Um, so the, there's a cost, uh, uh, you know, how much does it cost to flock someone? Um, I think you mentioned that was $25. So if, if I get flocked and I want you guys to go flock my friend, I pay you $25. You'll take them over and, and flock my friend. Yes. Okay. And, and then, up. yeah. And then and, the other one was, can, yeah, you can go online too. Oh, okay. Um, and that's where we found this fundraiser. You can go online and there's groups that have all the, the forms set up. They will sell you the flamingos. And we, we have approximately 40 flamingos at this point. Okay. And we usually put them in groups of five. Um, our community has found it to be best if we put the five just over by their mailbox, nice and just congregating around the mailbox. Um, we have seen pictures of, of like a hundred different flamingos sitting in someone's <laughs> yard all over the place. We've not, we've not done that, but we did have the band um, spend, donate quite a bit of money to have the band director's house have that done too. But that's the only time that we've ever done that. Um, and then uh, one, one last uh, question about this, and then we've got some Twitch questions in general for the panel uh, with our last eight to 10 minutes. Um, is there anything about your community, Jasper, that you think maybe made this fundraiser successful? I, I don't think there was anything unique about Jasper. I was happy that it went over as well as it did. Um, last year, I think we got about 2,000 off this fundraiser. Uh, 1,000 in the fall and about another 1,000 in the spring. Uh, we did not do it in the dead of winter. Uh, we stopped basically around Thanksgiving. So, but yes, nothing unique about our community. Obviously, this would not work if you're in like uh, downtown Indy or downtown Chicago. It'd be kind of hard to put put the, fl the flocks around a, an apartment. But like I said, if you have just your standard suburban type home, it works pretty well. Okay, great. Well, so uh, a couple of questions that we... Um, had here is that what's one piece of advice you might have for students uh, to keep them motivated when fundraising? Um, it, de depending on the fundraiser, it can drag out and be kind of tough. Do any of you have any advice for students? And, and it could be based on whatever it is you presented us this evening. Can I add on to that question? Yeah. Um, more so than just motivation, but also um, for students who may have reservations about asking people for money in general. I know that was something I struggled with as a child. Um, so can anyone speak to, you know, maybe you've had a student like that in the past or overcome that type of fear? So for our coupon books, um, we, you know, it's scary going door to door and it's scary to talk to people. And when you're looking at FLL, you know, you have kids that are nine years old, and then you have some kids who are 14 or 15 year old, depending on where you live. Um, and so many times we would partner an older with a younger together to go door to door. Um, we also had one of our dads last year is in sales. So he took an evening and he walked around and spent a half an hour with each kid going door to door to train them and teach them because that's what it's about. It's about training, it's about teaching, you know. And so he kind of coached them through what to say, how to respond, 
um, stood back while they were presenting, but then would kind of debrief as they walked to the next house and give them some tips and go through. Um, another thing we would do with the coupon books is once they got going with it, we had contest, honestly. Okay, you've got 10 books. Who can sell their 10 books the fastest? Let's go. And, you know, that was a motivation for the boys on our team because they're very competitive that way. Um, those are things that worked for us. Uh, our motivation a lot of time was just that, like, you know, the money you raise is the money that you're going to spend to, you know, have fun. So, like, the students that would be calling would literally be, you know, making an order on the next day to buy some parts or whatever. So thinking of it more like, oh, I need this money to, you know, do this thing. That's, uh, you know, better. It's not like, you know, raising money for a cause that's out here that, you know, you may not directly see the benefits of, but they directly, you know, see the benefit of it. They're staying in the hotel room, riding the bus, you know, all that. That was sort of our motivation. Um, and then also, you know, we had everyone calling, you know, at the beginning, everyone would call sponsors. Uh, but then, you know, as the time went on, uh, you know, some students went on to other projects uh, and you really got down to those few students that like, loved actually like they had a passion about you know calling random companies and asking for money um, which can be hard but uh you know and those students uh that had the passion to do that they focused on that rather than other things and that was sort of how we worked it out cool um the also, could i just add real quick chris yeah please, please if you yeah. do a fundraiser that like that pasta dinner that i mentioned earlier turn that into a team building um, kind of a team building exercise where it's fun and, you know, have every, have them dress up as the wait staff, um, or you have a team that's going to work in the kitchen or whatever that turns that event from kind of drudgery into something that's actually kind of fun. We did have a question off the Twitch. Somebody was asking if uh, uh, Chris Woodard, if um, law enforcement ever got called on you while you were flocking or if, uh, if they'd ever gotten called to come remove? No, we've, we've never had law enforcement get called. Um, I did pull up the flyer. And so let's see if I can share my screen again. And it has the price on there. Uh, so 15 donation to train technician will remove the flock, 20 donation <laughs> to train technician will remove and relocate the flock, $30 donation Flocking insurance will protect your home from future flockings. And then down here, you know, it just kind of says about what it is, but specifically the phone number, right? That I do think that that's important that when you have that, that you have someone that can immediately take care of any angry, uh, angry flocked people. So, um, but no, no trouble with law, law but yes, we have uh, had to immediately go pull flocks when someone has sent them out to a friend and the friend doesn't take it too well. Sure, sure. Um, One of had... the things that I, I also recommend is when you're planning some of these fundraisers that you do check with your local ordinances. Mm -hmm. I know in Connecticut, some towns di did not allow flocking and that kind of thing, um, as well as I know sometimes teams will do um, uh, raffles and Connecticut is a... Um, gambling state and that we have several large casinos. And so the rules around raffles are like, there's a lot of rules. And so I, I just always recommend to teams follow the rules because otherwise the state will fine you and there goes all your fundraising dollars. So Indiana is also a gaming state. Uh, thank you for bringing that up, Kathy. Yeah, there are, you can contact the gaming commission uh, and ask, uh, there are some exemptions for nonprofits and certain fundraising okay. levels, but, uh, but to your point, much better to find out and make the call and ask mm -hmm. uh, than, than uh, get fined. You're right. Uh, because anything that's considered a game of chance uh, does fall under the gaming commission here. And, and you don't want to draw negative publicity to your team. No. So. No, uh, one minute left uh, or so, and we're moving on to our next guest. Any kind of last thoughts, uh, Carissa? Um, anybody? I have a last question. Okay. Um, 
and it was for Kathy. Um, you mentioned the pay to play earlier. Um, and so my job is to help make the program um, more accessible to those of low socioeconomic status. And so I just wanted to kind of ask about the pay to play and see if there was a way um, to implement that, but then still have opportunities for those whose families may not be able to afford that membership. And so I know from experience that a lot of teams did have pay to play because it was considered like any other sport on their um, at their high school level. Uh, and so the, the students could work off that debt, so to speak, doing fundraising, participating in the car washes or, the, or whatever you might have going on. Um, also, they would also have a slush fund for scholarships for students that just could not afford to um, either pay or, or whatever, so. So a slush fund is additional money that the team has that they can, okay, that's wonderful, okay. Yeah, and then also in some states, you, you should also check with um, state law because in some cases, if there are student fees charged uh, in different states, they would require that students on free and reduced lunch would be charged a reduced or uh, zero fee. So I right, guys would love to continue this conversation. We are going to move on to our next speaker. I want to thank all of you for being a part of this. Uh, some great information. We're going to have some slides and some information uh, that was shared by our panelists here tonight uh, out on our website, uh, probably by early next week. Uh, and with that, I'm going to next, I'm going to introduce Priya, uh, our, uh, one of our student board of members who's gonna introduce our guest uh, for, the, uh, for the next session. So Priya, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and introduce our next guest. Yeah, hello, um, I'm Priya from our first Indiana Robotics uh, student board of directors. And today I'll be interviewing Mr. Dave Lavery. And he is the program executive of the Mars Science Laboratory mission and the joint European US Express mission and he's directed the NASA Telerobotics Technology Program for many, many years. And kind of our connection to Mr. Lavery is that he founded and directed the NASA Robotics Alliance Project, which included NASA participation in first robotics competition programs. And so this project focused on exposing high school students to um, real engineering challenges by having them work side by side with professional engineering mentors. So we're gonna be talking about his work in NASA and his work in FIRST and everything that he's passionate about. So my first question for you today, Mr. Lavery, is what is going on right now with solar system exploration? Um, okay, so that, there, there are two, an two ways to answer that question. One is going to take me about a minute and a half, and the other one is going to take me about two and a half days. So I'm going to give you the short version just right. to start with. Um, but realistically, we've got a very, very active solar system exploration program that stretches across not just the efforts within the United States, but truly globally. Um, there, there is an international effort to explore the, the planet throughout the solar system, and for that matter, asteroids and comets and, and, and other bodies as well that is reasonably well coordinated. Um, it's actually a community within the science and, and technology community for planetary exploration. It's a group that has been consistently working together and talking together ever since it formed. Um, the best example probably is even during the days, the, the, the height of the Cold War between the, the US and the, the former Soviet Union, as we were preparing to uh, launch missions to the moon and the, and the Soviet Union was doing the same thing. We didn't share our technology necessarily. We didn't necessarily show each other how we did things, but we did share the results. When we have a mission that landed on the moon, or in some cases in the early days, impacted the moon, but we got scientific data and results back, that information went back and forth within the science community very, very freely and completely independent of international borders. That same philosophy is true today. Uh, we have a long program that is actually just beginning right now associated with something called the Mars Sample Return Campaign, where it's actually a multiple mission campaign of sending a, a, a rover to Mars, picking up samples from a known context, sending another mission a couple of years later that will actually land a small rocket on the surface of Mars. The first mission, the rover from the first mission comes along, shoves the samples into the nose cone of that rocket, launches it up into Mars orbit, where a third mission coming along a few years later zips by, grabs that sample canister from orbit and brings it back to Earth. And all of that sequence of missions and activities 
they're not going to be carried out by just one country, but actually by a consortium of many, many different countries, the United States, the entirety of the European Space Agency, which is actually a, a consortium itself with 13 different co uh, countries participating together, potentially with Japanese and Russian participation as well in that entire effort. So that's a long-winded way of saying there's a global effort associated with exploring the solar system that is focused on not just one, but truly all the planets and all the small bodies within the solar system that involves all of Earth. Yeah, that's so cool. Well, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but do you have any like really cool stories that come to mind or updates about um, the Mars rover exploration? Um, actually, a lot. <laughs> so, All yeah. right. They, um, so one of the things is I've, I've been involved with the Mars exploration program uh, myself for over 25 years now. My, the very first Mars mission or ever, very first planetary mission that I ever worked on of any sort was the Sojourner rover, which flew on the Mars Pathfinder mission, launched in 1996, landed on the 4th of July in 97. And at the time, all anybody had ever done before was put um, or either orbiters, just missions that basically would go into Mars orbit or uh, uh, go into orbit and then do, in effect, high altitude photography uh, of the surface. And that was all we knew about the surface. The, the first step after that was a series of landers that would come down. And usually they'd have a static platform that would come down. Rocket propelled engines would basically lower it gently and slowly down to the Martian surface. Uh, legs would extend and it would land on those legs and it would just stay in that one spot. And a few times, for example, the, the Viking missions in the late 1970s, we might have a robotic arm that could reach out and grab the soil and maybe grab a little bit of soil, bring it back on board and do some analysis of that. But that was all we could do. Um, the Viking missions were actually really good examples where we could see really interesting stuff. A lot of uh, rock samples that the scientists were really desperate to reach out and grab and get a hold of and analyze that were just beyond the reach of the robotic arm. And so they effectively could never truly be sampled and left a lot of the scientific community very frustrated. Well, the Mars Pathfinder mission with the Sojourner rover changed all of that for the first time ever, rather than just having a, a lander that sat in one place, we actually had the ability to take a little mobile robotic laboratory and drive around on the surface of Mars. Now, Sojourner in sort of today's context was very simple. It was really intended most uh, specifically as a technology demonstration and experiment to show that the idea of a remote robotic lab actually could work. And it did that very, very well. It was a small device. It was about the size of a small microwave oven. It weighed on Earth, weighed 22 pounds. On Mars, weighed about nine pounds because they have one third of Earth's gravity. And all it was really supposed to do was just drive and show that we actually could operate something remotely on another planet at a 350 million miles away. And it was supposed to drive for about seven days. It was going to go about 10 meters and it was going to do one scientific measurement. Well, it turned out that we, um, we designed it so well that it w well survived the original benchmark for success. And instead of lasting seven days, it lasted 93 days. Instead of going 10 meters, it went 109 meters. Instead of doing one uh, science sample, it actually did about 21. And it actually turned out that the way the, the rover operated, we had this lander that, that brought it down to the surface and the lander actually acted as a communications relay station. It had a, the rover had a very small, short range uh, RF modem on board that it used to communicate with the lander, and then the lander would radio those signals back to Earth. We know that the rover lasted 93 days. We actually think it might've lasted a little bit longer than that, but we don't know for sure because that 93 days was not when the rover died, but it was actually when the lander died. So all of a sudden now we couldn't talk to the rover anymore. And so the rover, was still sitting up there, still functioning and still operating at the time that the lander died and we lost contact with it. And for all we know, the rover could have existed and, and continued to operate for quite some time after that. And we just don't know exactly how long. So that's, a, that's one example about how this whole process started. Um, as I said, that was my very first planetary mission. Um, one of the things that was really truly one of the highlights of my career was, is the knowledge that someday in the future, that we are going to have human missions to Mars and uh, there will be a human being who's going to land on the surface of Mars somewhere near that Mars Pathfinder operating site. They're going to walk over to that rover and pick it up and turn it over. 
And on the underside of that rover is a little etched aluminum plate with the signatures of the 47 people who actually worked on that rover project. And my signature is up in the top left-hand corner and they'll see my name on it. And I think that's kind of cool. That's awesome. Well, okay. So do you have any other like highlights in your career that are like milestones that you might've said you've been like, oh, this is a time when this really kind of paved a path for me in the future? Um, a lot is the, is the thing. Yeah. Many, many of them. I mean, realistically, I've, uh, when I was growing up, when I was young, um, in my neighborhood, when you grew up, you wanted to be one of three things. You either want to be a, a baseball player, a fireman, or an astronaut. Those were sort of the three career choices. And other kids on my block already had uh, baseball player and fireman covered. So I basically said, I want to be an astronaut. And so from the time that I was six years old, I wanted to work for NASA. That was like the one thing I wanted to do. Now, remember, this is, this is growing up in the very height of the Apollo era during the 1960s and the 70s. Um, and so the idea of being an astronaut, I was far from the only one who wanted to do that. But, but that was sort of my goal. I got as far as high school and I found out at the time, back then, the only way you could be an astronaut is you, you had to be a military test pilot first. I found out when I got to high school that my, my eyes were so bad that the military was never going to let me fly anything. And so that was just never going to happen. And so I realized, all right, well, if I can't go, if I can't be an astronaut myself, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do something close enough. I'm going to basically build machines that can be my proxies and go for me and I can explore space through the eyes of those machines. And that's sort of how I got interested in robotics um, and utilizing robots for, for exploration. And through a lot of very fortunate circumstances and events, I was able to follow through on that idea. Um, right after college, I, I, I truly almost by accident stumbled into a job opportunity with a contractor at NASA headquarters. And they called me um, about setting up a job interview. And when they said that the contract was gonna be at NASA headquarters, I sort of interrupted right there and said, look, how much do I have to pay you to come and work for you guys so I can be on site? Um, and and it was I was I was that excited about the opportunity because again this is what I'd wanted to do since I was six. And what I found was that 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 turned out at least for me to be exactly the right thing to do. What I was doing on that contract didn't really matter all that much. Now, it, what I was doing is actually designing computer systems and computer installations and stuff like that. But for me, the thing that was important is it was my opportunity to get a foot in the door at NASA. It was a way to get in there, to, to start finding out about the organization, to get practical experience, learn the people there, learn who was doing the sort of stuff that I wanted to do, make friends with them and talk to them a lot and then eventually sort of move my way over into that. And so that's actually exactly what happened after a couple of years as a contractor and learning about the organization, learning about the, where the work was that I was really interested in. I was able to transition over from a contract to an actual NASA federal employee uh, after, after several years and, and uh, was brought on board. And within a very short time after that was working in the robotics and artificial intelligence research program. Um, and ended up running that program for about 12 years um, after working there for a while. And that was the program that actually built the Sojourner rover that I just mentioned, that we actually built it as a, a research experiment and were able to, to actually fly it. Uh, and, and we basically sort of piggybacked on the Mars Pathfinder mission. Sojourner was just sort of this little add-on thing on the mission. The big primary mission was this lander that I had mentioned. And, um, but we got our technology experiment onto that mission as part of the research program that we were running. And um, from that, that was just, then it was just, I, I, that was my entree into the Mars exploration program and was able to sort of say, okay, I've, I've worked with the robotics community for a while. I had a lot of fun doing that, but now I've got my taste of actually working on a flight project, an actual mission that sends something somewhere. And this is really cool stuff. Now that I know those people, because I had met them because this one experience with the Sojourner Rover, I said, okay, let me jump over into that community and start working on more of that. And that, that's been the community in which I've been working for about the past 25 years ever since then. And have been able to, um, because I sort of started with that first Rover, have been able to be involved with every planetary Rover mission that we have flown ever since then. Starting with Sojourner on Mars Pathfinder, then doing the Spirit and the Opportunity Rovers in uh, launched in 2003, landing in January 2004, and then also being in charge of the Curiosity rover as part of the Mars Science Lab mission that landed in 2012. And I'm currently working on 
uh, the just named Perseverance rover that will be launching later on this summer, uh, landing in early February of next year. Uh, that's got a special hitchhiker on board that that I'll talk about in just a second. And then, um, and I've just started working on, and, and I'm sorry, and the, the, the Perseverance rover is the first mission in the sequence of this Mars sample return campaign that I mentioned a, a couple of minutes ago. Um, and so that, that whole process is gonna continue out through the end of this decade. Um, the one other thing I will mention that, that we think is really kind of cool is this Perseverance rover they'll be launching this summer. Actually, it's got a little hitchhiker payload on board the rover as well. Just like Sojourner was a hitchhiker on the Mars Pathfinder mission 25 years ago, this mission is going to have a little hitchhiker that's going to be doing a first of its kind technology experiment as well. That if everything works properly, um, that we will have this rover that's going to land in February of next year. And sometime in the first 90 days on the surface, this little hitchhiker that's attached to the underside of the rover is going to get deployed and the rover will drive away and back off about 100 meters. And then it's going to turn around and start looking at the first autonomous flying machine ever utilized on another planet. We're actually going to be taking a helicopter to Mars and a, an autonomous drone that we'll, we'll, we will deploy and position on the surface of Mars and we'll be conducting an experiment to make sure that um, our analysis is right. And we're going to attempt to actually fly an atmospheric craft based, based on the surface of Mars and actually do, do multiple autonomous drone flights on the surface of Mars as another whole new way of doing planetary exploration. And what we're hoping is that just like you might use drones here on Earth to do scouting or, sur uh, or um, doing surveying, and things like that, that we'll actually be able to use these drones to survey out in front of the path where we want to take the rover to look at the train ahead of us to say, is that someplace that we can drive safely? Is that someplace that's scientifically interesting? Is that someplace where maybe the rover can't go, but the helicopter can to pick up samples and bring them back for analysis? Those sort of tasks and activities, uh, we hope, will all be executed by this drone. And then if it's successful, We'll have a whole bunch of follow-on uh, helicopters and drones in future Mars missions, just like Sojourner created a whole follow-on list of rovers ever since it worked. Huh, that's pretty amazing. Um, okay, so there's a question from Twitch. How is NASA able to handle conflicts with missions interfering with missions from other entities, such as early on the Russian series of rockets to acquire samples from the moon during the U.S. mission to the moon? So there are actually a whole bunch of efforts to that we all work within to make sure that we don't interfere with each other, or in some cases, actually to make sure that we can interfere with each other. And by that, what I mean is, well, for the first part of the question. So there, there's a whole set of international organizations in which all the spacefaring nations um, participate to sort of coordinate their activities and say, hey, by the way, I'm launching a mission to Mars during this launch opportunity, and here's what I'm gonna be doing. Here's the trajectory that we're using. Here's the date that we intend to launch and all the other information associated with the mission so that the other countries know about it. So if they have something planned that's gonna be doing a similar effort that we don't um, cause conflict with each other. In fact, most of the time, doing, having something that's sort of stepping over on, on the, the toes of each other is not in general too big of a problem because space is really, really big. And so we, we don't generally run into each other or have the potential to run into each other. But what we do is, to the second part of the answer, we do coordinate activities quite a bit. For example, we've got the, the, the Curiosity rover that's down on the surface of Mars right now. The way that Curiosity, that we talk to Curiosity and Curiosity talks back to us is we have the capability using some of the antennas on the rover to talk from the rover directly to Earth. But it turns out that's actually a very, very slow, very inefficient way to communicate because the antenna that's on board the rover is very small. So we just can't do, uh, can't broadcast with enough energy to get the signal all the, all the way back to Earth at a reasonable speed. So what we do is we take advantage of the fact that there are a bunch of other spacecraft at Mars at well uh, right now. There, in fact, are a number of different spacecraft that are orbiting Mars. There is Mars Odyssey, which is one of the US missions that's been there since, two, since 2001. There's the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter that's been there since 2005. But there's also the Mars Express mission that was flown by the European Space Agency, which launched in 2003, has been in orbit ever since then. And, and additional orbiters, uh, the Trace Gas Orbiter, part of ExoMars is also there now. Again, another European mission. 
we all talk with each other and we all know that, hey, we're going to be flying these missions to Mars. Um, you know, while you're there, the fact that you're overflying the site where the Curiosity rover is operating means that we can actually use your orbiter just like we use a communications relay satellite back here on Earth. That basically, as these orbiters overfly the Mars site, and when they happen to do it about twice a day for each of these orbiters, we get a really short, about 10 or 15 minute window where it can have really, really rapid communication because it's a short distance just from the surface of Mars up to orbit, where it can dump a whole lot of data. And by a whole lot, I mean, in, in some passes, a few, uh, a few hundred megabits or excuse me, a few hundred megabytes or up to a one, one and a half uh, gigabytes of data. And I can dump all that really quickly. And then the orbiters, which do have really big antennas on them, they can then take that data and relay them back to Earth. So I get these short little bursts of communications that um, I can pass back and forth by taking advantage of the orbiters that are there. Okay, so the big question was, well, what does that mean for the international scene? Knowing that we were all gonna be there doing this, we all talk to each other and we make sure that the, the radio package that we have on board the all of the different orbiters, no matter where it's coming from, and all the different landers, they're all compatible. They can all talk with the same bandwidth. They all use the same command structure and know how to package commands so that the rover, for example, the rover can send signals up to Mars Odyssey, which is from the US. It can also send messages to Mars Express from the European Space Agency. It also has a capability of, of sending to Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter or the Trace Gas Orbiter, and the other ones from the US and, and uh, European Space Agency accordingly. And we have the same sort of negotiations, for example, when the Indian Space Agency want to send their MOM Orbiter to Mars. We talk to them as well about, can you have the same re relay communications capability? And you want to make sure you're compatible now because right now, if you send an orbiter to Mars, we may want to use that to relay signals from Curiosity but more important, when you send your Mars lander that you're envisioning later on during the 2020s, we can then support you when you're down the surface as well. So they all, they all have that level of coordination as well. And there are international working groups that work out all this sort of information and they meet several times a year just so we can all keep abreast of what each one uh, is doing and make sure that we can take advantage of those opportunities. Yeah, well, so on this topic of like cooperation, um, could you kind of um, talk about a time when you and your colleagues ran into a challenge and you had to work to sort of overcome that challenge or hurdle? Um, th there's a lot of them. I mean, there's what happens in a, uh, a planetary exploration mission really is, a, you know, I'll talk about, for example, the Curiosity mission is a really good analog for what we do in a first project. Um, that every mission, number one, we have, we have a very constrained budget. Okay, just like we've got a, a limit on how much we can put into the, the robot that goes out in the field during FRC, we have a very finite, very limited budget in terms of the spacecraft mission. Now, okay, yes, realistically, it's a lot bigger than the $5,000 I can put into my FRC robot. Um, you know, for example, the, the Curiosity rover mission is about two and a half billion dollars. But for a planetary exploration mission, that actually is a limited budget. And we, we, in the case of NASA, we have hard limits put on us by Congress in terms of how much money they're going to give us to do these projects. We have very specific tight deadlines. Um, just like for FRC, you've got to show up at a competition at a certain date. And if your robot's not done, you miss the competition. And they're not going to change that deadline for you. We have planetary alignment deadlines. We have a certain launch deadline um, in a launch window that is dictated by the position of the planets in their orbits. Basically, Kepler wrote the rules a long time ago about planetary motion, and they are laws. They don't change. If I miss my planetary launch window because my spacecraft is not ready or my rover is not ready, um, in the case of a Mars mission, I can't try again for two and a half years. Um, in the case of some certain opportunities, for example, for Jupiter, I don't get an optimum launch window again for 12 years. So you don't miss a launch window. The deadlines are really hard. Um, materials that we can use, just like in FRC, the materials or the list that we have is very specifically dictated by first in terms of what's legal and what's not, what motors we can use, what, what uh, computers we can use, things like that. Same thing in space exploration. There's a list of materials that we can use and a list of materials we very definitely can't use. And it's dictated by a lot of different constraints like um, we, we, the spacecraft has to meet certain weight limits. 
um, certain plastics you don't want to use because they off gas and that off gassing might coat the lenses of some of the, uh, the optics of some of your camera systems and you can't go out and send somebody up to wipe the lens off of the instrument and so there are all these different materials constraints that we of things that we can and can't use um, you know, Delrin, for example, is, is something that we absolutely don't use on planetary missions, specifically because of the, the off-gassing issues. And so all sorts of things like that map in. There are weight limits. I have to make my, my rover as light as possible because my rocket can only lift a certain amount and can only throw, 300, uh, throw the, the spacecraft 350 million miles to Mars if it's within my weight limits. And I cannot violate that. Just like in FRC, I have these weight limits for how much my robot can weigh. So there are all these different parallels and, and sets of problems that we have to solve. You know, and the, these sorts of things come up constantly in battling those constraints throughout the entire design period for the rovers. Probably the best example that I can think of, sort of one that, that caught us by surprise, is when we were launch, launching the Spirit and the Opportunity rovers back in 2003. Um, we, we ran into a problem where that launch window um, for, for when we could actually launch the first one, Spirit, to Mars was um, about a month long. And we got about a week before the launch window was supposed to open and we were all ready to, to launch the rocket. When all of a sudden we found out that the rocket itself had a problem where some of the, there's a, a cork insulation that wraps around the, the fuel tanks on the rocket, which are very, very cold um, with, because of the, uh, the liquid oxygen and fuel. And that, that cork insulation was debonding. And that was going to mean a big problem as the, as the rocket was launching, where potentially this insulation could, could fall off um, and affect the flight characteristics of the rocket. So all of a sudden, you know, we're a week away from launch. And is there a way for us to figure out how to fix this problem? And it ended up that we actually had to go back in all the way back to, to how the original uh, rocket had been manufactured and look at the steps all the way through and the specific adhesives and the type of cork that was uh, utilized and, and go back in and, and rethink and, and reanalyze all those material decisions that had been made in some cases a couple of years before and, and go back into the design references and find out how it had been manufactured and whether that stuff was something that had to be redone and reapplied and, and, and retested. Now, it turned out that all that ended up taking a couple of weeks. So we ate into that little launch window, that one month launch window. We ate about almost three weeks into it, but we did get it fixed and uh, were able to launch again on time and then got the, so the Spirit rover down the surface of Mars in time. But those sorts of problems get thrown at you constantly throughout the entire engineering life cycle, and the entire engineering design process that we go through with these rovers. Um, another question from Twitch. Um, does NASA have plans to use new rockets other than the Soyuz, I think is the pronunciation, to bring humans into space into the future? So um, NASA's uh, big effort right now, the thing that sort of the entire agency is really focused on in our long-term strategy is all about supporting an eventual human mission to Mars. Now, I can't tell you right now exactly when that is going to happen, uh, but what we are working for is trying to make that happen sometime in the next decade, in the 2030s. And the expectation is that we're gonna be working, we are, we are working now on all the technologies and all the launch systems and all the su supporting efforts to get humans back into space um, and from uh, US soil within the next few years and then on to the moon within a couple of years after that and utilizing the moon as a testing ground in effect for validating a lot of the technologies that would then support a human mission to Mars as soon as we can make it happen. Um, the plan right now is there's a program within NASA called Artemis that is all about the, hu the eventual human exploration of Mars. And it sort of dovetails into the science driven program that I'm working on right now, which is utilizing robots to explore Mars. I mean, the reality right now is as of today, Mars is the one planet that we know of that is completely populated by robots, um, that the, the, the entire population is mechanical and robotic. Um, and it's been that way. And if you think about it, um, most of the students yeah, most of the students um, that are in uh, FIRST right now have never known a time when there was not an active robot on the surface of Mars. Uh, we've had robots there and actively operating ever since January of 2004 and intermittently before that. 
but we have this long-term robotic presence that's doing a lot of the fundamental research and a lot of the fundamental exploration and investigation to do two things. One, to try to understand Mars better so we can understand our solar system better and through that understand Earth better, but also do a lot of the precursor work to prepare for an eventual human mission to Mars. We're exploring Mars right now because with robots because that's the tools that we have. We don't have the ability to put people there yet, but eventually we will be putting people there. And knowing that, we can have those robots do a lot of investigation to figure out where's a good place to land. When we do land, what resources are there that we can make use of when we send a human crew to Mars? Are there things that they can do or places that they can go that will allow them to do what's called ISRU, in-situ resource utilization, to take and process either the Mars atmosphere or the soil on Mars, or maybe water ice is trapped beneath the surface of Mars and process that and use it to uh, get water that the astronauts can then live on or process the atmosphere and pull out the CO2 and then crack that into the carbon and the oxygen components to use to create oxygen for the astronauts to breathe, all that sort of stuff. All of those are things that the robotic exploration program is doing now. But in parallel, while that's going on, the Artemis program and then its components, things like the SLS, the Space Launch System, which is this big, gigantic rocket that we're building right now that will be bigger than the Saturn V, that will be used as a heavy lift vehicle to get humans to Mars and get their, their, um, their habitats and their equipment that they'll need when they're exploring the surface of Mars, get all that stuff there. All that, def uh, all that um, development work is going on right now and will be flying very soon. So answer the question, are there systems other than Soyuz to, uh, that will be used for the human exploration of Mars? Yes, absolutely. There are lots of them that are in development right now. It's actually a very, very large effort. Okay, well, so it's pretty clear that you build really robust uh, robots that last much longer than the machine's expected life. So do you have any advice for first teams on how they can build more robust robots? Um, building more, the, the, the real answer to that question is test it, test it again, test it again, test it again, and iterate as many times as you possibly can. Um, one of the things that we do is, is we will design systems for a very high likelihood of surviving as primary mission. And what I mean by that is, for example, Spirit and Opportunity, their design lifetime was 90 days on the surface of Mars. And, but within the sort of the NASA construct, what that means is I'm going to design it so that I have better than 99% confidence that if I get this rover down to the surface of Mars, I'm 99% confident that it's going to be able to survive its primary mission period, which is 90 days. Now, it turns out when you do that, that having 99% confidence in being able to live on the surface for 90 days sort of automatically means that comes along with that, that you, have, that you get a reasonably high confidence that it's going to live more than 90 days. Um, generally what that means is that you're going to design it very, very robustly so that all the stuff that's going to happen during that, that 90 day period that the environment of Mars would throw at it, like a rugged terrain or temperature extremes. Um, Mars, for example, has highs during the day. If you're at the equator of Mars, equator of Mars in midsummer, it might get up around 60 degrees Fahrenheit, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. But at night, it may get down to 50, 60, 70 degrees below zero. Your rover has to be designed to handle that temperature swing day after day after day. So when you design things for those sort of environmental constraints, it turns out that, yeah, I can design it so I'm 99% confident it's gonna survive 90 days, but that means automatically that I'm about 85% confident that it's going to last 120 days. I'm about 80% confident it's going to last 180 days. I'm about 75% confident it's going to last 300 days. And so it extends on out like that. And the way you do it is you design for the extremes and then you test it. You know, we took that rover that we designed for negative 50 degrees and positive 70 degrees, but then we tested it to 100 degrees Fahrenheit on the high end and negative 150 on the low end. And, and we went sort of way beyond what we thought the rover was gonna have to do, tested it, found out how it performed, tweaked the design and made it so it could survive 
twice what we expected it to to actually encounter. How does that translate into FRC (laughs) is a really good example. Your robot is going to get hit by other robots. How do you handle that? Well, you take it and you know you're going to be impacted by another robot. So I'm going to test it to make sure it can survive an impact. Well, I want I want to survive not just an impact with an FRC robot. I want to survive twice the impact an FRC robot is ever going to give me. So how, how do I test for that? Simple. Take the bumpers off your robot and run it into a cinder block wall as fast as you can three different times <coughs> and see if your rover can survive that. If you, your, your robot can survive that. If your FRC robot survives running into a cinder block wall three times at full speed, it's probably going to survive running into another FRC robot with bumpers on out of the field. You do that sort of stuff over and over and over again. Uh, probably. Um, another question from Twitch. Um, how much will the success of Gateway affect the viability of the Artemis program? So what Gateway, for the people who don't know about it, Gateway is designed to be, in effect, a, a small orbiting laboratory in lunar orbit that will be flying uh, later on this decade that will be used as a transfer station and, and a laboratory in and of itself to test out a lot of the technologies that we hope will then be validated and utilized for a human mission to Mars. Um, ga- the concept of gateway in and of itself sort of by definition can't fail because it is a laboratory. Its purpose is to conduct experiments. If you take something up there and that something breaks or doesn't work properly, well, that is a valid result of the experiment. You found out this doesn't work. And so I'm gonna go back and try it again. And so as, as, a, as a flying lab, it almost by definition, as long as it gets to conduct at least one of those experiments and finds out, did this work or did this not work, it will be a successful lab. Now, the, the, but, but the other part of it is, is that a reasonable way to, to do things? And is that what we indeed are going to do? That is our plan right now is to utilize both the gateway in lunar orbit, as well as eventually labs down on the surface of the moon to test and validate these technologies and make sure that they really work the way that we want them to work. And so all of those are going to be, again, operating labs to do research, to do technology development, that as long as we get to use them for that purpose, by definition, they're going to be successful at fulfilling their function. Now, individual technologies might work or might not work, and that's what we're going to go and find out. And we may find out, and in fact, we expect to find out some things were really, really good ideas back here on Earth, but when we got them up on the surface of the moon, eh, yeah, not so much. And so we'll, we'll come back, we'll rethink, we'll redesign, we'll do it again. And then eventually that's how you, you iterate, you test, you iterate, and, and then eventually you get an operational version that works the way you want it to, and you send it to Mars with people. Yeah, um, another question from Twitch. Um, early on with more primitive qu- equipment, every component had to be made for specific use. Now with more versatile, smaller computers, do you run into instability with relying on these newer computers? Does the rocket crash when Windows crashes? <laughs> Um, Okay, so first thing to understand is the computers that we use for space applications are by necessity several generations behind what you would have on your desktop, your laptop computer right now. Um, The the computer that we used, uh, for example, on board the Curiosity rover was what we call a RAD 750, basically a radiation hardened processor that runs at about 200 megahertz. So it's not even a one gigahertz processor. And the reason that that's the case is, the, the, the key was the, how I sort of started off that, sen- that sentence, it's the RAD 750 is a radiation hardened computer. Space computers are, or computers that are used in the space environment have to be made in a, in, a mechan- in, in a way that allows them to survive the higher radiation environments that are out in interplanetary space. And so what tends to happen is they are very specialized versions of common commercial processors. But because we have to make a specialized version of them, that basically the traces are larger, so they can withstand a cosmic ray hit and things like that. Um, they're, they get made um, by special order and that the ability to make them tends to lag behind the commercial use because typically um, a, 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 a CPU manufacturer may need to make 
you know, a few hundred of these or maybe a few thousand of these specifically for NASA's purposes or the Department of Defense purposes and their, their spacecraft um, and, and some of the commercial community purposes. You know, maybe they're making a few hundred or a few thousand of these. They're not making millions or tens of millions of them like they might make in, in a standard commercial processor. So the time it takes to get them made tends to lag behind what they're doing for commercial reasons. And so the, like I said, these, these processors are, um, I'll put it this way, you've got more processing power in your cell phone by far, probably by an order of magnitude or two um, than we have on board the Curiosity rover right now. And so the, it's not a case of new technology causing us to trip up, but rather it's a case of we have to maintain computer languages and programming styles that use technology that was consistent with what you would have had 10 or 15 years ago. So it's really sort of old technology that we're still using because we have to. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so kind of switching tracks here. Um, I really want to know how you got involved in FIRST and what your journey in FIRST Robotics was like. Okay, so I, um, I mentioned that early in my career, I ended up running the robotics technology for NASA uh, for about 12 years. And one of the things that we were, and, and so this would have been um, during the, the 1990s. And one of the things that we noticed is we had a process where every spring we would have all of our different laboratories that were involved in robotics research at the time come in and give us proposals for what research they wanted to conduct and, and what tasks that they wanted to have funded. And we started to notice that it was the same people coming back every year. And every year they were getting a little bit older and a little bit grayer. And the, it was, it, it was you know, just a, a concern that started to pop up saying, wait a minute, where are the younger researchers um, with, the, with the interesting new ideas and sort of fresh outlooks on things? What's, where, what's happening with that? And we realized that just the, the, there weren't that many of them in the pipeline which caused us a concern because I was looking forward at that point, knowing that we were going to be building planetary rovers and robotic exploration systems and utilizing robots on board structures like space station, things like that. And realizing that the people who were doing research who are getting older and grayer um, weren't, didn't have any younger versions in the cells. And when those guys all eventually retired, there wasn't going to be anybody in the pipeline to continue this work. And right about that time, there were a couple of, of students, young students in my neighborhood um, who happened to see a little blurb on, I think it was 2020, um, about first. And this was like 1995. And they came down the street, um, three, three students in particular. And they came down the street and talked to me and my next door, uh, my neighbor, uh, Dave Miller, who worked at the Jet Propulsion Lab. And they talked to the two of us and they said, hey, Dave and Dave, you guys work with robots for NASA. We found out about the robot competition thing. Um, would you guys help us build a robot to compete? And I didn't know any better. So I said, yes. And so all of a sudden my one year commitment to help them build a robot one time turned into me 25 years later, still working with my FRC team and still mentoring my team, but also going back and saying, after seeing my very first FRC competition back in the day, suddenly realizing that all the students that were competing, the high school students that were competing in this thing were exactly the sort of students that NASA needed to fill this pipeline of researchers that was empty. And so I went back after that first year to my robotics research program. And I basically told them, um, this is a program you guys all need to be involved with. I believe so strongly that you need to be involved with it, that I'm going to put a requirement on all of my research labs. You, if you want research money next year for your lab, you must sponsor an FRC team for at least one year. And that's gonna be a requirement in, in order for you to get your research funds. And I, I only made them do it one year, but I knew because I knew that these guys and what they were like, if they did it one year, they were gonna be hooked just like I was. And so they, they all went out and did it. They all started up the teams um, that we all got back going back in the day. And ever since then, every NASA robotics research lab has had a FRC team that they've been working with. And those are the teams that um, some of us now know. That's team like one, teams like 118, the Robonauts team, uh, 233 Pink out of Florida, um, 254, the Cheesy Poofs, the Beach Bots 330 out of Florida, excuse me, out of California, um, team 120 out of Cleveland. You know, all those teams 
had their roots from the NASA Robotics Technology Program in the late 1990s, and that was how they all got started. And because of all that, NASA as an organization realized two things. Number one, this was where we were going to get our future robotic engineers who were then going to go off and build all these rovers and the space station robots and things like that that I've mentioned. And indeed, we have several FIRST alumni that have come in and have, are now working for NASA and are building these systems. But also, it was, a, it was a way for all of NASA to be involved in a project that really spoke to exactly what we're about, the excitement of, of engineering and science and technology and building things that you design yourself and actually watching your creation come to life. That's what we love to do. So it was absolutely something that was very easy for us to decide, yeah, we want to be involved with this. Yeah, absolutely. So can you tell us a little bit more about what FIRST was like in the 1990s? Because a lot <laughs> of our viewers today are much younger and wouldn't know how it was like. Um, uh, wow, it was, um, it, it was uh, a lot more interesting in terms of the potential for really, really serious mistakes is probably the best way to say it. it there, there was, um, because the things like, for example, things like uh, Vex Robotics, things like Andy Mark, uh, the, the West Coast Drives, you know, all those things that we've all come to know and accept and just have wrapped as part of our ethos right now. None of that stuff existed back, in, back then. Um, you know, the kit of parts literally was uh, a, an old computer printer that was taken apart and you had a couple of motors out of a printer or a, a, there were motors out of um, Bosch drills that you were given and you had to figure out how to make this Bosch drill motor that was never ever designed to drive a wheel and how to fit, you had to figure out how to connect it to a wheel and make the wheel turn. Um, there was uh, for the FRC competitions, this is a, back in a time when the control system was not something that you got in the kit of parts and got to, to keep and use and keep your robots up and running. And it was basically something you borrowed from first. There was a finite supply of about 95 control systems and you got it in your kit of parts and you got to use it during um, the three months of the, the build season, the competition season. Then you had to send it back because uh, somebody else was gonna use it next year, which meant once your robot ended the season, that was it. That was all you could do. You could never drive that robot anymore because it didn't have a control system anymore. And so we, you know, a lot of us sort of reverse engineered the control system and came up with hacked versions of it that we started to publish plans for um, and so we could keep our robots running during the summer and do off-season events and things like that. Um, but it was really a, a much more of a uh, a sort of a junkyard wars mentality where you went in and you had to figure out how to use a whole bunch of pieces and parts that were never designed to work together and how to fit them together um, into, and, and so it wasn't something where I could buy a solution for a drive system or a turret system or a shooter. Um, and what I had to do was rather than sort of thinking big in terms of optimizing a design, everything was all in the details of, you know, I, every, how do I make this one gear fit on this one shaft because it was never supposed to. And we were all designing and custom cutting our own gears and designing our own gearboxes and things like um, shifting gearboxes had never been done before within that community. So the first time somebody came out with a gearbox that actually had two speeds was this huge revolution within the community. Um, and the thing that was also really interesting and a lot of fun and one of the really truly inspiring parts of it was when that sh first shifting gearbox came out and from the, the, some of the chief Delphi teams, um, the first thing they did was publish their design and shared it with everybody and said, here's how we solve this program or this problem. And here's how you guys can do it too, because we want everybody to be out on the field with better robots. And that was really how the whole, again, the whole ethos of cooperation really came about early on in the process. Now, having said that, I'll also say that during those early years, the competitions themselves, the, the individual tournament events and the matches were a lot rougher no bumpers were on robots back then. So you had 
full speed, one end of the field to the other, two robots ramming into each other as hard as they could, and your robots had to be designed to withstand that. Flipping robots was not only, not only was it legal, it was actively encouraged. You were, a part of your design constraint was, or design uh, set of requirements was the ability to build a robot that could be turned over and you had to be able to self-write yourself to continue on with the match. Um, uh, and also th back then it was a single, um, everything was a single elimination competition. So you could spend your entire build season building your robot go to uh, the competition and um, it was actually a double elimination competition. You lost two matches and boom, you were done. That was your whole season. And, and so that was before we had the round robin qualifiers um, that we have now. And so, yeah, there were a lot of things that were quite different. And, and it was first figuring out how to make the season and the competitions work well in a way that allowed people to really take advantage of a good design challenge and, and show off their skills and their ability at, at, with the design problem, but also how to have a competition that allowed you to participate in a way that lets you ex experience the competition event itself for, for quite a while and advance based on how well you had done your robot without getting knocked out after just four minutes of, of competition. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another question from Twitch. Um, if you have to go about producing a replacement for older components, is it difficult to manufacture a component you may not have to for decades? Um, yeah, and that also speaks to why you want to document your projects really, really well and the importance of good documentation. Um, my, my college degree and, and my graduate work are both in computer science and artificial intelligence. And within the software world, you know, programmers hate to document anything. It's always the last thing that you do. You know, you, you sit down you, you, and you cut a couple thousand line, the lines of code. And the last thing you want to do is sit down and write some more stuff about what you just did. But the reality is, if you've got a, a, a line of code or a, or a piece of mechanism um, or an approach to how you solved a problem or a part of an instrument that may survive and still be used 10 or 20 or 30 years from now, long after you're not involved with the project anymore, it's critically important that you document stuff properly. And because again, 10, 20, 30 years from now, somebody's gonna be coming along and gonna to have to decipher what you did and figure out how to upgrade it or how to maintain it or how to make use of it. You know, we have within the, the NASA construct it's kind of a unique place because we all work on projects um, that have extraordinarily long lifetimes, um, even extraordinarily long development cycles. You know, a lot of people that I work with, a lot of people I, that I know and my friends who are in the commercial community, they have deadlines that are targeted at, you know, maybe the next fiscal quarter, um, three months down the road, they've got, they, they have to show a specific result as specific product or, you know, their, their, their launch deadline for a, a new marketed product is, if they're lucky, maybe a year away. Within the spacecraft community, we work on projects where the difference from the start time to when you actually launch, the norm for that is 10 years. And in some cases, it's a lot longer. Um, I'm working on a project now that I know I will not see the end of this project in my professional career. And there's a really good possibility that I won't see the end of the, of the, the, the campaign in my lifetime. And that's within NASA is not unusual. So knowing that the stuff I'm working on now um, may not finish and will still be in use again, a couple of decades from now gives us the mindset to say, write stuff down, not just here's what I did, but very, very important. Here's why I did it this way write down the philosophy you had behind why you made a certain choice, because that becomes critically important as well when that system is gonna be maintained later on. All right, that's a really thorough answer. And now just to kind of wrap things up, we've got our most important questions of the day. Um, everyone wants to know, how do you get a Hawaiian shirt with a NASA logo? <laughs> um, so there's only one place right now that I know that you can get them. And it's the, at the employee gift store at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. And unless you're a NASA employee and you can get on base, you can't get them anywhere else. Um, they, they, um, 
well, so we we've, we've uh, within the NASA FRC community, we've been wearing Hawaiian shirts for 25 years, ever since we started this thing. Um, it also it became uh, an emblem of a, a couple of different space shuttle and space station crews. And so NASA had a whole bunch of them made up that, that are, um, like I said, sourced from the, the NASA employee store at Johnson Space Center. But right now, as far as I know, that's the only place to get them. And another question on everyone's minds is how many bites does it take for you to eat a whole Krispy Kreme donut? <laughs> One. Uh, <laughs> and there's video um, that it, it can be done with more than that. But if you do it right, it only takes one bite. All right. Well, just to finish off this uh, interview, I'd like to know what inspires you and what do you look forward to every day when you go into NASA or to work with robotics teams? What inspires you? Um, th that one's really easy. I, I am extraordinarily lucky that I have what I think is the coolest job in the world, or for that matter, the coolest job off the world. Um, I get to, to walk into my office every morning and the first thing I do, actually, well, not right now because we're all remote teleworking um, <laughs> because of the current situation. But normally when I go into my office, the first thing I do is I put on a virtual reality headset and I get to explore through images that were downloaded during the night of the surface of Mars where the rover is exploring. And I get a brand new view every morning of the surface of Mars that nobody else in the world has seen before. And that is one of the coolest things ever that I get to do. And just to have that opportunity to get that chance gets me really excited and makes me want to go into work every day. And you know, that's really what's going on now. But the reality is, um, I said, I've been very fortunate that I, I've, I've had some extraordinary opportunities over the course of my career with NASA. Um, I've spent time inside a spacesuit, inside the neutral buoyancy simulator, um, working on the space station mock-ups and, and basically understanding some of the training the astronauts go, have gone through. I've flown nine times on the NASA zero gravity aircraft, the Vomit Comet, and it's named that for a reason. Um, and so, you know, I, I've, I've, I've got experience in zero gravity and understanding what it's like to work in that environment. I spent in time inside of active volcano in Antarctica um, and with a robot that we deployed um, in, in Antarctica and, and with another robot we deployed inside an active volcano up in Alaska called Dante. Um, and we actually had a, a movie that was a Hollywood movie that was made about one of our robots called Dante's Peak. It's a Pierce Brosnan movie if everyone want to go look it up and see it. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've had incredible experiences like that, that, um, that I've had just because I, I've been very fortunate working the place that I do work. Um, and behind all of that though, have been the people that I get to work with who have made all those particular experiences possible. I, I got to meet my three heroes. I mentioned, you know, ever since I was six years old, I wanted to work for NASA. My three heroes growing up were John Glenn, the first American in space, Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon, and Chuck Yeager, the first human to fly faster than the speed of sound. Over the course of my career, I got to meet all three of them and, and, and talk with them. And uh, to be able to, to meet the guys who inspired you and, and tell them thank you for what you did and, and getting me to the point that I can then have these other experiences within the agency is something that's very special. And that stuff keeps me excited. You know, um, uh, Chuck Yeager is, is, is still around. Unfortunately, you know, John Glenn and Neil Armstrong have both passed on. But doing, being able to do, even in a small way, the stuff that those guys did is, um, is what keeps me excited and keeps me inspired. And, and hopefully the stuff that the people I work with today, the stuff that they're doing now in terms of preparing with Artemis and with the, um, the, the space launch system and the Mars exploration program and the rovers that we're building now, all those sort of things, those will be the things that will inspire you guys um, to picking up this sort of work and continuing it on when we're ready to move on. Yeah, and thank you so much for joining us. We're so honored to have you on the First United Robotics live stream. And we had a really great time speaking to you and answering questions from the viewers. And we really appreciate all your work that you've done. Glad to. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I got to know, uh, so that's Mars uh, behind you? Yes, it is. So that actually is one of the photographs I mentioned from the Curiosity rover 
um, just behind me. That is one of the lower slopes of Mount Sharp in Gale Crater on Mars, where the rover is, is located and is exploring right now. Wow. Well, thank you, Mr. Lavery, for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Um, thank you for all your uh, years in FIRST uh, and getting NASA, uh, the different NASA organizations involved in FIRST. Uh, it's, it's inspiring uh, to us to uh, be even associated with, with NASA, because uh, I'm sure, like, like yourself, many of us uh, uh, have idolized those, uh, those three those three astronauts and pilots that you mentioned earlier, uh, we've all looked up to them and, and bringing back as, as Dean Kamen wants, you know, the, the idea that we, we elevate uh, engineers and scientists uh, back up into the limelight again. So thank you for being a part of that. No, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, a fantastic interview, Priya. Thank you so much uh, for yeah, thank you. Uh, doing that. And uh, we're going to wrap up this evening with a conversation on how to put together a winning pick list. Um, our guest is uh, Brian Maher. Uh, Brian, one, I hope I said your name correctly. Uh, we're gonna bring Brian into the call. Hey, very Brian. good. So Brian, did I say your name correctly? Is no, it Maher? Maher. Maher, okay, very good. Uh, so I'll uh, I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, the, the topic is, of course, you know, how to put together a winning pick list. Uh, and let you go from there. And I will, uh, I'll be monitoring our Twitch chat for questions. All right, cool. Um, hi everyone, my name is Brian and I'm going to be talking about how to make a winning pick list and how to prepare yourself to pick a really strong playoff alliance, which is such an important part of having a shot at winning your competitions. So, a little bit about me to get started. Um, I currently mentor Team 333, the Megalodons in Brooklyn, New York. Um, when I was in college at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, I mentored Team 2791, Shaker Robotics. And before that, I was a student on Team 1257 in New Jersey. I'm currently a software engineer at Bloomberg in New York City. And fun fact, my favorite robot of all time is Team 469 in 2010. Um, if you haven't seen that robot before, I recommend you check it out. Really cool, really creative strategy. All right, so um, before I get into the details of the pick list stuff, um, scouting, good scouting is a really important part of this process. And I don't wanna get too deep into that because I could do a whole nother talk about that pretty easily. Um, but I'm just gonna talk about how what, me, what it means for scouting data to be good and really useful for making a good pick list and putting together that winning alliance. It should be complete. You scout as many matches as possible and don't have holes in your data. Um, so you're not missing anything that might be important. Um, your data should be accurate. No one collects perfect scouting data. It just doesn't happen. It's really hard. Um, but you and your team should do your best to try and put together mostly right-ish data that you can look at and trust to be generally correct. Um, your, the data you should collect should be relevant because you want to have the right information for you to come up with your strategies and figure out who the right picks are. Um, and if your data is not relevant, you're just wasting your scouts time and that's not great. And good data should be um, easy to visualize and analyze. You should have some tools in place that will help you uh, make it easy to look at your data and understand the story that it's trying to tell. All right, so what is a pick list? It is a document that a team creates to help them with alliance selection. And it should list who you want to pick and ideally a bit of information about each team um, as a reminder for why you want to pick them. You should use your scouting data to come up with this. Um, the rankings are, um, well, they are very important for determining who the captains are, um, are not amazing at telling you who the good teams are all the time. Teams can have lucky schedules or unlucky schedules 
or they might break for a few matches and um, have a few zero RP matches that tank their ranking. Um, you really need to have good scouting data uh, to tell you the real story. And if you don't have good scouting data, uh, you should find a friend and ask them nicely. A lot of teams are willing to scare their scouting data. Um, if you mention that you're in a bind, you need some help. Um, and your list of teams should be uh, at least 23 teams long. I like to throw on a couple extra in case someone has a rough second day. Uh, but you should have 23 teams. He has 23 plus one. These are 24 teams in playoff, you know, for plus one being you. Uh, so it's important to be ready. Even if you're the eighth seed and you don't think you'll get picked early, it could happen. And it's really better to be prepared for it. Uh, when should you make a pick list? Um, if you're likely to rank in the top 15, you could be an alliance captain and should be prepared to be a captain, even if you think it's unlikely, it could. I've been, to, I went to a, cap, a competition once where all of the first round picks happened within the top teams and the 15th ranked team did become the eighth lines captain. So it can happen. Um, if you think you might be a first round pick, you should be prepared because first round picks can help the captain make the second pick. Um, and you could be picked in the first round because you're one of the really strong robots in the competition. You could get picked in the first round because your friend had a really lucky match schedule and they have no clue what they're doing. So they pick you because they're, you're their friend and they know you. Um, and then you especially need to be ready to make a really solid second pick. Um, so pretty much most of the time, if you think you have a shot of needing a pick list, you should have one ready. And now we're gonna talk a bit about how to actually make a pick list. Like when you're sitting down with your team um, before the second day of the competition that night, um, what I like to talk about to come up with my list. So first discuss what your goal is for the competition, um, especially picking up district points versus winning. Um, since most of you guys are in Indiana, um, your goal is probably to maximize the number of district points you pick up in playoffs. Um, so make sure that the whole team who's involved with picking understands how that system works um, and agrees that that's the priority. Whereas um, focusing on winning above all else um, may involve taking a different approach that focuses on, uh, it might be uh, less risky because if your goal is winning, if your primary goal is winning above all else, the difference between quarterfinals and semifinals doesn't mean a whole lot. But when you're looking at district points, that's 10 district points, which could easily be the difference between uh, making it to state champs or making it to worlds. Uh, next. Uh, discuss your own robot's strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and you should do this by scouting yourself during the matches and looking at the data you collect. Um, everyone, pretty much everyone, when you ask them about what their robot can do, uh, what comes to mind will be their best match. And I'm sure most of you, as I'm saying this, are thinking of the same thing. And what's coming to mind is your robot's best performance it's had. Well, your robot's not always going to play its best performance. Uh, look at the numbers and see how it actually plays out and discuss the kind of role that you can contribute to different kinds of alliances. Then uh, talk about what kind of alliance you want to build and choose a strategy that lets you play a role that you'd be good at. You should pick something that plays to your strengths and ideally helps uh, downplay your weaknesses. Um, next, I like to ask who the top teams at the event, event is, both in terms of who is at the top of the rankings and who is the best according to our scouting data stats. And we want to talk a bit about uh, what we think they'll try and do in playoffs and what would beat it. 
um, it's really important that you don't build the wrong kind of alliance. And watching early competitions can provide really valuable insight as to how successful alliances play a particular game. Um, just as a quick example of that, I know there was a lot of talk in 2018 about uh, uh, being able to put together an alliance that could um, that could own both the switches and not really worry about the scale. And since that's worth as many points as the scale, they would uh, if they do a little bit better at everything else, they win the match. In reality, when teams tried to execute this strategy, it usually didn't work because once uh, once alliance uh, stops going after the scale because they want it, then they go and take the switches and it wouldn't usually pan out. So watch early competitions in the season to get a sense for what works and what doesn't. Uh, once you settle on strategy, talk about your needs and your wants for the picks. Um, you know, the needs are the things that are absolutely essential qualities in the robot you pick to be able to successfully execute your strategy. And the wants are the other things that are nice to have and add value, but are not as essential. So for 2791, in 2019, uh, most of our competitions, we played with a uh, two offense robot, one defense robot strategy. And if, um, so we were able to score pretty well and we had a climber. So our goal, our one need that we really had was being able to score lots of game pieces in Tele. Um, and some of our wants for the captain first pick robot was uh, it was nice if they could climb so that we wouldn't have to because um, we were usually the stronger scorer on the alliance. So it was nice to have someone else who could climb at the end so we'd have more time to score. Um, autonomous scoring or sandstorm scoring uh, was a want, but it wasn't a need because there wasn't a significant, there wasn't a point bonus associated with it. Um, and then for second pick, we had a different list um, where really the only need we had was being able to play decent defense. And then some of the wants we had were um, lines, level two or level three. Um, they were nice to have, but we didn't need them to execute the strategy. Uh, sandstorm scoring was nice. Um, so once you have that list, you can the list of what you're looking for, you can start to actually make a pick list. And here's the process I like to use. Um, there are a lot of different valid ways to go about this that will all lead you to roughly the same place. Um, but here's what I like to do. I like to start by taking some stat in my scouting data, um, usually average game pieces scored. Um, sometimes it's average points scored or max game pieces scored by a team in the match and sort all the teams of the competition based on that to get a very rough order of who's good to get a sense for um, just have a reasonable order to talk about teams in. this isn't your pick list this is just um, the order you're going to talk about the teams uh, then i take the top ranked team based on this sort and look at their data take the next team after that look at their data compare them decide which one we think better suits what we're looking for um, put them in order and then we look at the third team on that list look at their data compare with the other two and put them where we think they belong in that list and keep going until we have our 23 plus a couple teams um, Okay. Uh, as for how to actually compare the teams, I like to look at four different things mostly. Uh, compatibility, how well that robot would play the game with my robot. Um, as an example of that from this year, uh, say uh, my team's robot 
uh, was really good at shooting power cells into the high goal, but I could only do it from the spot directly on the wall against up against the wall in front of the goal. Um, that's great. Um, and even if the next best or the best shooter at the competition also use that spot, they might not be the right pick if they could only shoot from that same spot uh, because coordinating, sharing that spot in a really efficient way uh, is it, challenging. And you could only have one of you shooting at once. So even if the next best shooter is a bit uh, scores fewer balls, over, a bit fewer balls overall, they might be the right pick for you because of that compatibility component. Um, next is uh, what the ability of the robot, what they're actually capable of, um, and what like what can they do in their best match. I don't think I need to go into too much detail about the fact that robots who can do the things you want them to do are good. Um, but you know, you want to look at that list of uh, needs and wants that you have and prioritize robots who can hit on a lot of them. Uh, next, and you usually find out uh, what a robot's peak ability is by taking the maximum of whatever scouting data stats you're looking at. Uh, next is reliability. How often do they play well? How often does their robot work? Uh, this is a really important component um, because ideally you want a partner who will work in all of your matches and never have a break. Unfortunately, robots break sometimes. Um, and there may be other factors that prevent them from playing to their highest ability every match. It's good to get an understanding of how reliable and consistent teams are. And lastly, trend over time is very important. Um, ideally, you want a robot who plays, as like I said, really well all the time. Uh, that is usually not an option, especially if you have lowered down the alliance selection list. So you may have to make a choice between uh, teams who are inconsistent. Usually, a team doing Worse in the beginning and getting better over time is a really good sign uh, because it showed that they have either figured out how to make their robot better or they fixed an issue. And they're, if they played well, their last couple of matches, they're probably going to play pretty well in playoffs. Like those are the most representative matches of how they're going to do in playoffs. Uh, so that's a good sign. If a team started really well, in their first couple of matches and then got worse and worse and worse over time, that shows that something might have broken or they're having some issues that they don't know how to sort out, which is not great and does not bode well for playoffs. Uh, one thing to keep in mind in either of those uh, directions where they're trending over time is it can be very valuable to ask the team uh, what's going on ask them what their deal is, and uh, find out for yourself why the trend is happening. Um, I've, uh, my teams have in the past landed some really solid picks by asking teams the right questions and finding uh, teams that have been overlooked. And we've also dodged a few bullets, uh, avoiding teams who have issues that even they don't understand. Um, and a great way to visualize trends over time is taking all of your data points and putting them in a line chart so you can easily see if they're going up or down over time. Um, sometimes these four things can be at odds with each other, uh, especially reliability and ability, which gets me to the trade off of consistency versus ceiling. Uh, should you prioritize a team with High ability or high reliability? And the answer is depends. It'd be ideal to get a team who plays really well all the time, 
but sometimes that's not an option and you need to make a choice. And to make that choice, you need to know your opponents. Even if you don't know exactly who you're playing against, just having a sense for um, if you're going to need a reliable partner who won't drop the ball, or if you'll need a wild card that might have an amazing match to pull off the crazy upset. Usually, seeds one, two, and three will have a captain who's pretty consistent and usually want pretty consistent picks to minimize the risk of losing. And usually, the six, seven, eight alliances will have a hard matchup against that, con those consistent alliances and need to put together as much scoring potential as possible to have a shot of winning quarterfinals. Because it's okay to be risky here if that's what it takes to win. An eighth alliance can be the most consistent alliance there, but if they can never outscore alliance number one it, in two matches, it is literally impossible for them to win. Uh, so you need to be smart and about the risk involved and understand when to play it safe and when to be risky. Uh, some other general tips for the pick listing conversation, uh, go to bed at a reasonable time. Uh, for regional and district events, I make sure that things are over by midnight absolute latest. Um, I try really hard to keep conversations on task because the longer, the more off topic conversation you have, the longer the meeting's gonna drag on. And if it goes really late, everyone will be really tired the next day and the conversation you have will be less productive. So keep it focused, get it done, go to bed at a reasonable time. Don't get too hung up on any one team or comparison because unless, unless it's champs, you're still gonna have plenty of data to collect the next day. So don't go crazy agonizing over this team who averages 0.1 more balls than the other is really better or not. Just wait till the next day, collect more information. And if you're curious about something about another team's robot or matches, uh, write down your question, go over to their pit the next day and ask them. I do this a lot, especially when a team has a bad match or their robot breaks because I want to understand why and make it, be able to make a decision on whether they should, whether we should be really concerned or whether we can brush it off. Um, and I also, if I'm planning on a defense oriented strategy, I like to ask teams who haven't played defense yet if they're willing to play it. Uh, one time we didn't do this, and we picked a team to play defense who had never played defense. They were not super excited to be playing defense and it was an awkward conversation that it would have been nice to have avoided. All right, some common mistakes I see from teams in alliance selection is not playing, not choosing with a strategy in mind for the alliance. There are, I've, there've been a lot of times where I've seen uh, a team just pick the two best teams left, which a lot of the time is the right move, but there's often not much foresight about how those teams can play together and really play together as one cohesive alliance. Another common issue is picking based on brand name and not, or not using your scouting data for other reasons. Um, my personal opinion, and there are others out there who disagree with me on this, is that it should be a tiebreaker at most between teams who have similar robots. I think it can be reasonable to give a preference to a team with a bit of a name and some history of competitive success. Um, because there are good habits that go into those patterns of success, but I think that that is secondary to the robots themselves. Uh, not having a good pick list, meeting, agenda, or organization uh, can lead to having a less productive conversation where you don't get a strong list. Uh, not having a long enough pick list. Anyone who's been doing this for a few seasons has seen someone take five or six minutes to come up with their pick, uh, which they are fully allowed to do. And if you need that time, 
There's no time limit. Take as much time as you need. But being in that position, because you don't have a long enough pick list and don't have a plan, is really not a fun position to be in. So I'd recommend avoiding it if at all possible and make sure you have your 23 teams on your list. Another common mistake is upping a team too much because of one good match or lowering a team too much because of one bad match. Uh, it's really important that you consider each match in the context of a team's whole trend. Like if you have a team scoring 20 power cells a match, who scores uh, zero power cells in one match, uh, you should probably, you probably shouldn't write them off because they had one bad match. And lastly, a very common thing I've seen is teams looking blindly at averages. Averages are very helpful for providing a quick summary of about what a team can do in a match, but all that stuff about uh, how compatible their robot is with yours that I talked about, how, how high their ceiling is, how consistent they are, what their trend is over time, all that information gets squished away when you turn all those numbers into an average. Um, you, you have, at a large competition, you'll have eight data points for teams. At a district event, you'll have 12. Take the time, look at all of them. It's really not that many, and you just end up with such a fuller picture of what a team is capable of. Uh, the morning of, uh, keep collecting data and updating your list. Uh, have whoever goes up for alliance selection watch lots of matches, keep an eye on what's going on. Uh, make sure that your communication is being with other teams is being coordinated by one or two people because when people who aren't really in the loop and making these decisions try and transmit messages to other teams, uh, things get uh, misheard and miscommunicated and it's just not, it's not good communication and can uh, blow up in people's faces. Uh, it's like a game of telephone. It's really not a good way to plan a line selection. And keep an eye on the rankings because things that you assumed would be true uh, during the pick listing meeting might stop being true. Like that team you were super sure was going to seed first, might have a couple of bad matches and fall down. Uh, you might have assumed that you weren't going to be a captain, but have a few lucky matches and uh, bump up. So just keep up with what's going on and adjusting your plans accordingly. Uh, and to wrap things up, I'm going to talk a bit about when to decline, because when you decline another team's invitation to join the, your, their alliance, you are no longer allowed to accept anyone else. So you should use your pick list as a guide to figure out what exactly, whether declining would put you in a better position or not. And you should decline if you think you can build a better alliance by saying no. So either you think you'll get a team that's higher on your pick list than that team that you declined in the first round, or you think uh, getting a later second round pick will be really valuable. Or even if it, you'd end up with a worse alliance, if you can end up in a better position in the bracket to achieve those goals you defined at the beginning of your pick list meeting, uh, that might help a lot. So if you're looking for district points and you get picked by uh, the number five captain, it might, it might make sense, even if you won't pick a team who's as good as the number five captain, it might make sense to decline so that you don't have to face, you face the number one alliance in finals instead of semifinals, and you might have an easier time getting as many district points as you can. And that's pretty much it. Um, I'd be happy to answer questions people have. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, Brian, for the information, uh, a lot of different things to think about there. We did have a couple questions uh, from Twitch. We got a, just a couple minutes left here on tonight's uh, broadcast. So 
Um, do you see defense played in different ways in different regions? That, that's a really good question. Um, well, we ask I good think, questions here yeah. in Indiana, Brian. <laughs> um, I think there's some variation. I think the more common thing I see vary between different regions is uh, how much defense gets played um, and whether there's a tendency to go toward um, having a defender versus triple offense. Um, I, there are some regions where it's really common to see like you have a defender in almost every match. I think um, as a mentor in New York, I'd say New York was pretty heavy on defense. Um, New England is kind of notorious over the years for their pretty heavy defense. Um, whereas I think all the time, I, I def, that's a good question. I'm going to have to think about that one a bit. That's right. Hey, maybe one last, that, that's all right. Maybe one last thing, um, a, a thought for a small team that maybe doesn't yeah. have enough resources to um, scout. Maybe just a couple of tips for them. Yeah. Um, I definitely recommend reaching out to other teams in your area. If you don't think you can have the six people, uh, six people from your team watching the matches all the time, I definitely recommend reaching out to other teams in your area and trying to coordinate a scouting alliance to make sure that you have that complete data that really helps with uh, preparing for alliance selection. Great. Well, and, and uh, counting on gracious professionalism, which many of our teams are, are so good at. Uh, we've got a lot of good teams that are willing to share their data with other teams uh, if, they just ask, if they just ask for it. Yeah, our so. team, yeah. We've had a few cases in the past where we've had um, other teams in our area. Uh, they want to scout, but they don't have the manpower. Um, and we have a pretty large team. Uh, so usually we like to have um, our students collecting our data, but we, what we've done in the past is have like a student or two from a smaller team at a time, at all times, collecting data with us, and then we share the data with them after. That's well, that's absolutely uh, that's a nice thing to do, and it helps, and it uh, yeah, I, I think that's a fantastic way of of doing that. Uh, well, thank you so much for your time, Brian. Uh, we appreciate it. Some really good information. This will be recorded and put out on our YouTube channel uh, so other teams uh, can see this information. Uh, thank you. And I want to thank everybody, all our guests this evening. We had a fantastic lineup from uh, Sam Geckler opening up with alternative fuels and renewable energy. Uh, with our, We had a fundraising panel this evening that had some really good uh, tips. We're going to get those links out onto our website as well. And then the, the fantastic interview uh, with Dave Lavery, uh, Priya uh, interviewing Dave, some really cool things about what's going on in NASA and space exploration. So really great day. Uh, a reminder to everybody, we will not be on the air tomorrow, Friday, April 10th, but we will be back Thursday, April 16th with more virtual content. Uh, next week, we'll be on Thursday and Friday. So thanks again. Thank you, Brian. Thanks to everybody who participated tonight. Uh, and we hope you all have an absolutely wonderful evening. Thank you guys so much for having me. This is a lot of fun. And if anyone has any uh, further questions about this kind of stuff, I love talking about this stuff. Feel free to give me a PM on Chief Delphi. Uh, my username is my name with an underscore. So uh, thanks again. Great. Thank you, Brian. Have a good night. Thanks, you too. Yep.